Good morning, expert participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is our pleasure to welcome you to this virtual expert group meeting, implementing Beijing Plus 25 commitments in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Srinivas Tata. He is the director of the Social Development Division at SCAP uh, to deliver his welcome remarks. Dr. Tata, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chana. Distinguished participants, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, a very warm welcome to this virtual expert group meeting on implementing Beijing Plus 25 commitments, especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the new normal. I wish we could have had all of you here in person, but this is what we operate in. And this is, we hope that we'll make the best use of technology in order to reach out to all of you. On behalf of SCAP, I extend my warm gratitude to all of you for your enthusiastic participation in this important event. In fact, we've been quite overwhelmed by uh, your response. We are um, especially pleased to co-organize this virtual meeting with our strong partners, you and women, who have been our steadfast, who have stood by, I mean, work, whom we, are, who we feel it's a privilege to work with in championing women's equality and empowerment in the Asia-Pacific region and across the globe. This meeting intends to facilitate an exchange of knowledge and good practices and discuss the way forward uh, in the implementation of the Beijing Plus 25 commitments, which were adopted at the Asia Pacific Ministerial Conference last November. We hope to draw upon your collective knowledge to produce recommendations for the region to accelerate implementation of the Beijing Platform for Action and the declaration, which has now um, kind of attained increased urgency in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. It may be cliched, but it's good to remind ourselves that the Asia Pacific region has made good progress in the empowerment of women and girls over the last 25 years. But as they say, much work remains to be done. Further, the progress that we have made is threatened by the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, our Secretary General has repeatedly warned us that the devastating social and economic impact on women and girls is reversing the limited and fragile progress on gender equality that the region had made. Some of the areas facing the greatest threat from the pandemic, which we will focus on today, include women's economic empowerment and the elimination of violence against women and girls. Women's economic empowerment still has a long way to go across the Asia Pacific region. The gap between male and, labor, male and female labor force participation is more than 30%. Furthermore, women's labor force participation um, as, on an average has declined since 1995 from 55% in 1995 to 50% in 2018. Women who are employed are more likely to find work in the informal sector with limited access to social protection and other employment benefits. We all know that women continue to bear the brunt of unpaid care work at home. On an average, women spend four times more time on unpaid care work than their male counterparts across Asia Pacific. The long hours that women put into unpaid care detracts from their ability to undertake paid work outside the home, limiting them from exploring the full economic potential. Unfortunately, many women and girls in our region continue to experience ex violence at the hands of intimate partners. Globally, 30% of women on an average suffer this type of violence. In Asia Pacific, this figure ranges from 15% to 68% of women across different countries and subregions. More must be done clearly to ensure safety of women and girls. The COVID-19 pandemic has gendered effects that in large part are attributable to the existing social and economic equalities, inequalities that women have long faced. For instance, the incidence of violence against women is, is, clear, is reported to be increasing during the pandemic across a range of countries. This is especially true for domestic violence. Women are also at a greater risk of losing their income and livelihoods. The year 2020 marks the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action and the five-year milestone of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The Asia-Pacific Beijing Plus 25 Declaration recognizes and situates women and girls as active, as active agents of change for the region's development and outlines key actions by governments with support of stakeholders 
to close gender gaps and realize women rights. In addition to our intergovernmental convenership at SCAP, we are focusing on three key areas in our analytical and capacity development work, which is economic empowerment of women, leadership, and improving gender statistics. On the issue of women's economic empowerment, we recognize that entrepreneurship is a catalyst for women's economic empowerment and sustainable economic growth. Women entrepreneurs face complex barriers that limit their opportunities to start up and grow their business. Such obstacles range from a lack of access to finance and technology to low levels of financial and digital literacy and also to negative gender stereotypes. SCAP's Catalyzing Women's Entrepreneurship Program is addressing such challenges using an ecosystem approach. We're working with governments to improve policies and regulations with financial institutions and private sector to invest in women entrepreneurs and to provide more innovative financial and digital solutions. COVID-19 has impacted micro, small and medium enterprises greatly. SCAP has been supporting the governments of Cambodia, Vietnam, Fiji and Samoa to help mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on women-led MSMEs. The second issue that I want to focus on women's political participation and leadership. Although the share of women in positions of leadership has increased over the past two decades, the numbers are very far from reaching gender parity. Women's participation and leadership are critical for sustainable development, and therefore it's important to utilize our regional intergovernmental platform to continuously advocate this issue. Last but not least, I'd like to focus on improving data and statistics. There is a lack of gender data to inform decision making and monitor progress. To improve gender data production and use, SCAP has developed a data, policy data integration tool called EPIC, which is essentially every policy is connected to help strengthen national statistical systems. We are of course working, working in close cooperation and collaboration with member states, civil society, and other stakeholders, and above all, with our key partners, UN agencies, especially UN women in our endeavor. And you will see a real uh, improvement in our statistics work along in partnership with UN Women. We are of course working in close cooperation and uh, we, uh, with everyone and we look forward to suggestions from you of how we can then sharpen the support that we are offering member states. I wish you the most fruitful of dialogues and look forward to your insightful inputs and recommendations for the implementation of the Asia Pacific Declaration on Gender Equality over the next five years. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tata, for these warm welcome remarks. It is now my pleasure to introduce Ms. Sarah Knips, Deputy Regional Director of UN Women Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Ms. Knips, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Srinivas Tata, Director of the Social Development Division of UNSGAP and this meeting's co-convener. Distinguished delegates from government, civil society, academia, and the private sector, UN colleagues, dear participants. I'm really honored to join you this morning on behalf of the UN Women Regional Director for Asia and Pacific, Mohamed Nasiri. Thank you all for committing your time to participate in this virtual export expert group meeting. This gathering builds on the momentum of the Asia Pacific Ministerial Conference on the Beijing Plus 25 Review, which was held in November 2019, and which adopted the Asia Pacific Declaration on Advancing Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment. Over the next two days, we look forward to an exchange of knowledge and good practice, building on all of your significant and valuable experience to develop recommendations of priority actions to advance the implementation of the declaration. Exactly 25 years ago today, at the conclusion of the Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing, the global community adopted the Beijing Platform for Action. This is a bold agenda for the transformation needed to realize the human rights of women and girls. This was an extraordinary moment in the struggle for gender equality. However, in spite of the activism of grassroots women and the hard-won gains of women working for change in the public policy sphere and in their private lives, no country in the world has yet achieved gender equality. Systemic barriers to equality persist and they require transformative approaches and new alliances that engage governments, the women's movement and the private sector. Earlier this year, UN Women published a major stock-taking report, 
which showed that progress towards gender equality is faltering and hard-won advances are already being reversed. These worrying trends are made more acute by the current COVID-19 pandemic. As Dr. Tata has already outlined for us, the pandemic is exacerbating existing inequalities and threatening to reverse gains. The impacts of COVID-19 on women and girls include lost incomes and livelihoods, with a recent UN Women and UNDP report reflecting that the pandemic is expected to push as many as 47 million girls and women below the poverty line. We know that women are also facing increased violence at this time, including intimate partner violence in the domestic sphere, sexual abuse, exploitation, and cyber violence. Women both work in the front line of the COVID response while also bearing the brunt of increased domestic and un increased unpaid domestic and care work in the home. In some countries and sub-regions, including some in our own region, pandemic impacts are compounded by climate-related challenges such as cyclones, flooding, and mudslides. And in other contexts, we see the challenges to the exercise of fundamental freedoms, limiting the space for civil society and for women human rights defenders. Like other institutions that are represented here today, UN Women has been working with our partners, governments, academia, civil society, UN partners and the private sector to respond to the pandemic. This has included increased efforts to collect data and to support evidence-based programmatic interventions, to address pandemic impacts in line with the UN framework, the immediate socioeconomic response to COVID-19, which was launched in April. So our meeting today is a very important opportunity to review some key regional data points on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on specific gender related indicators, including those around SDG 5. It's also an opportunity to share experience and to discuss the status of women's rights across a number of interrelated areas. I hope we can also began, begin to examine how our responses to the pandemic from the humanitarian response to economic stimulus packages, to reinventions of working life and our efforts to create solidarity across social and physical distance. How all of these can be turned into opportunities to build back better for girls and women. Distinguished participants, the upcoming UN General Assembly will provide a key opportunity to bring to the forefront the continuing relevance of the Beijing Platform for Action and to move the needle on implementation. Global leaders will come together for a high-level meeting on accelerating the realization of gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls on the 1st of October. This event will aim to reinforce the message that building equality and in inclusive societies is more urgent and desperately needed than ever. As you are all aware, urgent action is needed to address policy and legislative gaps that allow inequalities in both opportunities and outcomes. This includes reviewing national policies and laws and looking into how they can and should address attitudes and social norms that structure power relations that are embedded in patterns of gender inequality, gender discrimination and patriarchy. It also means prioritizing financing to ensure the implementation of much needed measures, including through gender transformative economic stimulus packages and social protection measures in response to COVID-19. Over the next two days, we hope that ourselves and all of you will benefit from the shared experience and expertise to define key, de key recommendations for the acceleration of the implementation of the Asia Pacific Declaration on actions that we can take to safeguard and build on the hard won gains on gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. It's very important that this gathering brings together women and men from different sectors, countries, expertise and life experiences. Diverse voices are important because the experience of the last 25 years has underlined that effective measures to realize women's human rights need to be framed intersectionally, taking account of the different experiences women and girls face as a result of race, age, class, sexual orientation, gender identity and disability, among other factors. I'd like to close by thanking you once again for joining this discussion virtually. We so much appreciate you being here with us. We very much look forward to hearing your ideas on how we can work together effectively to advance gender equality and women's empowerment in Asia Pacific. We wish everyone a productive discussion. And thank you once again to our partners in ESCAP. Thank you. Thank you very much to Dr. Tata and Ms. Knips for these cogent opening remarks and a warm welcome to everyone to our virtual expert group meeting, implementing Beijing plus 25 commitments in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Thank you for joining us today as we discuss our commitments to gender equality and the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. Today we have with us a large number of experts and professionals working to make Sustainable Development Goal 5 on gender equality and the Beijing Plus 25 declaration a reality. We have government representatives and policymakers, civil society representatives, private sector representatives, and colleagues from UN agencies, funds and programs from across Asia and the Pacific. The objectives of the virtual expert group meeting are twofold. First, to facilitate the exchange of knowledge, good practices and lessons learned with respect to the progressive implementation of the Beijing Platform for Action, especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. What has the pandemic meant for the region's progress in gender equality? And second, to develop key recommendations for priority actions to advance the implementation of the Asia-Pacific Declaration on Advancing Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment, which was adopted in the November 2019 Ministerial Conference. Together, we will discuss different dimensions of inclusive and sustainable social development, namely the socioeconomic, political, and environmental components. We will have five sessions over the span of two days and will conclude this expert group meeting with a key set of recommendations for our path forward. The outcome of this meeting will also inform the work of ESCAP and UN Women in supporting Asia Pacific countries and implementing our gender commitments. Next slide, please. The virtual EGM will consist of five sessions. We will hear from experts of different topics and discuss recommendations for going forward. The first session will introduce the outcome of the Asia Pacific Beijing Plus 25 review through presentations on the declaration and will place the subsequent discussions within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. The following sessions will address key gender issues. Session two will focus on women's economic empowerment. Session three on addressing violence against women and session four on women and environmental sustainability. All sessions will integrate perspectives on the overall socioeconomic response to the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on women and girls, including the ways in which the pandemic has ex exacerbated the disproportionate amount of unpaid care and domestic works translated into lost livelihoods and incomes, especially within informal work and increased incidences of violence against women and girls. The objective of the final session, session five, will be to articulate these key recommendations. And please note that we will begin our meeting tomorrow at 9 a.m. Thailand Standard Time. That is half an hour earlier than today. Next slide, please. Before we begin today's session, a few housekeeping announcements. These have also been entered into the chat box. So while we encourage your active participation in the discussions, please do turn your camera off and mute your microphone when not speaking. Please also refer to the technical note that was circulated in advance of the meeting for further details. To facilitate your participation in the session discussions and to ensure other participants the opportunity to engage effectively, we would kindly request that you use the Zoom chat function during the session presentations to write in any comments, questions that you may have or wish to flag for the attention of the session moderator, indicating if to one of the speakers to whom the question or comment is being addressed. And we kindly request you that you make your questions, comments brief and succinct, and that you include your full name and affiliation, please. Now, in view of the limited time for this meeting and the large number of participants, we kindly ask for your understanding that all participants may not be able to take the floor. Rest assured, however, that all your questions and commentaries submitted in the chat box will be considered both for the attention of the moderators and speakers' attention during the sessions, as well as in the meeting report that we will issue after the meeting. Finally, towards the end of day two, we will also share a link to our evaluation in the chat box, and we would very much appreciate you taking your time to complete this short questionnaire. Next slide, please. Again, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to working together and continuing this important discussion. We will now move to session one. 
This session will introduce the framework of the Beijing Declaration through a number of presentations. And I will now hand over the floor to Ms. Chai Chai, Chief of SCAP's Gender Equality and Social Inclusion section to moderate this first session. Ms. Chai Chai, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shanae. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, um, since 1995, gender equality has become central to the realization of inclusive and sustainable global development. And women's empowerment was integrated into the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals with a dedicated goal on gender equality. While we have seen lots of progress, recent reviews of BPFA show that many challenges remain it has been a long journey towards gender equality and the empowerment of women. We still have a long road ahead. Uh, so Huda uh, will be playing the slides and now we move to the next slides. Um, I want to just briefly mention more than 600 participants from 54 countries attended the Asia Pacific Ministerial Conference last November. The conference resulted in the adoption of the Asia Pacific Declaration on Advancing Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment. It is a comprehensive set of commitments and actions on region specific issues that can move forward the gender equality agenda over the next five years. The Beijing Plus 25 Declaration calls government and other actors to intensify actions to realize gender equality. These actions are clustered around the six thematic areas, including equitable and inclusive development, poverty reduction, social protection, freedom from violence, participation, social dialogue, accountability, as well as the important role of national women's machinery for, for gender equality. Peaceful and uh, inclusive societies, highlighting women's role as active change agents. And uh, the last uh, thematic areas, uh, environmental conservation, climate change, and resilience building. In addition, the declaration highlighted the importance of data and statistics, as well as partnerships and regional cooperation. While the region is gearing up, uh, to implement these commitments. In the past eight months, the COVID-19 pandemic has heightened and amplified existing inequalities and threatens to undo the progress made in poverty reduction and gender equality. So in the first session, we'd like to consider broad questions. What can be done to ensure strengthened commitments to implement the Beijing Platform for Action and the Beijing Plus 25 review outcomes? taking into consideration of the context of the ongoing COVID pandemic. So now I uh, want to just, uh, as you can see on the slides, we have an amazing panel of speakers, of women leaders, advocates, and pra practitioners from government, UN, and civil society for this uh, first session. I also want to mention briefly the outline for session one. Move to the next slide, please. We will start with presentation from our five panelists. Each presenter has eight minutes. I have to request all speakers please keep to this time limit. And we will hear from our speakers on their take on Beijing Plus 25 review and the, the, the impact of COVID-19 and how it affects uh, SDG 5. And then we will have about 30 minutes scheduled for discussion. I want to uh, suggest our discussion could be guided by the following questions. Let me share uh, with you these guiding questions while, while our speakers uh, present their perspectives. So this leaves you some time for digestion and perhaps um, uh, uh, thinking around these questions. First question, what should be the next step in realizing the goals set in the Beijing Plus 25 declaration? What is needed to turn this commitment into action at different levels, regional, sub-regional, national, and local? Second question, we are only a decade away from 2030. As evidence suggests, the Asia-Pacific region is unlikely 
to achieve the SDGs by 2030 without accelerated action? What should be accelerated action look like? Third question. The COVID-19 pandemic is threatening to undo decades of progress made in some areas. What can member states, the UN, and the CSO do to ensure continuous advancement in gender equality and women's empowerment? Finally, partnerships and collaboration are central to both the 2030 Agenda and to the Beijing Plus 25 Declaration. Are there some examples of effective partnerships and collaboration from the Asia-Pacific region? Okay, so this is a brief introduction for this session. Before I invited the panelists to take the floor, I'd like to emphasize for any questions and comments, please use the Zoom chat function. The Secretariat is taking note of your inputs. With that, now I'm pleased to invite our first panelist, Ms. Emily Vikati. She is a Divisional Women's Interest Officer, Ministry of Women, Children, and Poverty Alleviation from Fiji. While Emily is a civil servant with the government, she had worked with NGOs with rich experience in community-based and hospital-based social work, and she enjoyed working closely with women at the community level. Emily, please share your perspectives about the Beijing Plus 25 review and Fiji's experience. Over to you, Emily. Emily, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Um, dear participants, Mbula Vinaka and warm greetings from Fiji. On behalf of the Minister for Women, Children and Poverty Alleviation, the Honorable Mary Saini Vuniwanga, and our Permanent Secretary, Ms. Jennifer Poole, and our Director of Women, Ms. Selai Korvuseri, I would like to present our take um, on, on uh, the Asia Pacific uh, Declaration on Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women. Uh, just to uh, uh, draw you to uh, what I will be presenting briefly um, is uh, before you. Uh, just present a short context and background on um, the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. Um, on the second point, Beijing plus 25 review outcomes, the summary of key achievements, summary of key challenges, and the e key actions that are outlined in the Asia Pacific Declaration. Also on the fourth point, we'd like to um, add a Fiji context on uh, the gendered impacts of COVID-19. Thank you, next slide please. Twenty-five years ago, some 50,000 women and men from 189 countries arrived in Beijing, China for the First World Conference on Women, determined to recognize the rights of women and girls as human rights. The conference culminated in the adoption of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, the most comprehensive policy agenda for the empowerment of women. In Beijing, we dreamt that the daily life of all women and girls would be radically transformed that girls in the future would be born in a world full of opportunities where they could learn and grow, that every woman and girl could lead a life free from all forms of violence and oppression, with access to education, healthcare, decent work, and decision-making at all levels. These dreams were put on paper and became global agreements that we expected would be translated into reality. In the years following, women and girls pressed these dreams and agenda forward leading local, regional, and global movements on issues ranging from economic empowerment to ending violence against women and girls, from sexual and reproductive health rights, climate justice, and equal pay. And no doubt that we are shaking the pillars of patriarchy. And um, as has been mentioned by the previous speakers, um, a lot has been done. Um, and uh, every five years since 1995, progress in achieving the strategic objectives has been reviewed by the Commission on Status of Women. And uh, we are here now, fast forward to 2020. Um, let's see, next slide, please.
Yes, as we look back, much has been achieved globally and for us in the region, such transformations indeed were advanced by the Beijing agenda and more importantly, by the enormous work of women's rights organizations. However, we all observe that progress has been slow and persisting patterns of inequality are stalling further progress on gender equality. As a result, member states were called upon to undertake national level reviews um, of the progress made and challenges um, that were encountered in the implementation of the Declaration and Platform for Action. Um, thus, the Asia Pacific Ministerial Conference was uh, convened on the 27th to 29th of November 2019 um, in attendance of more than 600 participants. 54 countries and 166 civil society organizations. Member states uh, then adopted the Asia Pacific Declaration on advancing gender equality and women's empowerment. So these, uh, the, the culmination of a, of a comprehensive set of commitments and actions on region specific issues that uh, can see the acceleration on the progress towards gender equality over the next five years. Also historical for us um, in, uh, in Fiji um, was when our Minister for Women, the Honorable Mary Saini Boniwanga, was elected as chair of the Asia Pacific Ministerial Conference. And so this was the first for Fiji and uh, also for the Pacific region. Next slide, please. I shall now take us through um, the outcomes of the Beijing Plus 25 review and the, the key achievements. Um, as we can see, um, there are five groups um, that are before you. Um, and uh, these were the, the, the list that the Asia Pacific countries um, had come up with on the achievements for the past five years. <clears throat> Excuse me, and you can see um, the first is adoption of laws, regulations, action plan and policies. Um, women's economic empowerment, improvement of women's political participation and decision-making power, the presence of national gender machinery and data and statistics. I shall briefly mention or highlight uh, some key achievements along each of the five uh, groups that you have before you. Uh, for the first, uh, in terms of the adoption of laws, 63% of countries in the review identified the adoption of laws, regulations, action plans, and policies as one of the key achievements over the review period. 33 countries have a current gender strategy or national action plan on gender equality, and 47 countries have ratified CEDAW. Uh, to the second on women's economic empowerment, 63% of the countries have reported the advancement of, of WE as one of the key achievements despite the falling participation rates of women in the labor force and rising informality, countries have strengthened legislative measures with regard to equality in the workplace, developed laws and policies and programs to achieve work-life balance. And also women's entrepreneurship is seen as a pathway towards women. In terms of the third group on um, improved participation, improvement of women's political participation. Um, one of the key achievements was that 49% of the countries in the review identified the improvement of women's participation and decision-making um, for countries in the region, achieving more than 30% in national parliamentary representation. And I'd like to mention for Fiji, um, women's representation in parliament has increased from 16 to 20% of which 23% hold cabinet positions, which consists of three ministers and two assistant ministers. Um, just an example. Then I shall go on to the fourth group um, where all countries in the review have reported the presence of national gender machinery. And for 28 countries, gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls are key priorities in national plans or strategies for achieving the SDGs. Though two countries did not consider these and four countries in the region did not have a national strategy or action plan for achieving the goals during the review. The fifth grouping on data and statistics, 
countries have made the most progress in producing knowledge products on gender statistics, conducting new surveys to produce national baseline information on gender related topics. Data are a key means of implementation of the 2030 agenda, whereby 12 countries identified that still data gaps are a key impediment to the advancement of gender equality in the region. Next slide, please. In terms of the key challenges, there were three key challenges that were outlined in the review. The first was the barriers to women's economic participation, the second, gender norms and stereotypes, and third, the lack of gender capacities in implementing gender equality policies, plans, and programs. I would just like to add on and highlight um, some key um, challenges according to those groupings. For the first one, 49% of the countries noted that the difficulties of navigating the future terrain of work presented a key challenge in the region. Technological challenges, climate change, and demographic shifts are forces that are changing the landscape of work. For example, in five member countries of the ASEAN Association of the Southeast Asian Nations, namely Cambodia, Indonesia, and the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam, it was found that women were more likely than men to be employed in an occupation at high risk of automation and were therefore more susceptible to losing their jobs. In terms of gender norms and stereotypes, 41% of the countries reported that the translation of policies, plans, and programs into concrete actions was being stifled by adverse gender norms and stereotypes. Countries noted the need to raise the awareness and understanding of parliamentarians, public service employees, and the public more broadly. The third grouping, 41% of the countries noted a lack of capacity among individuals and entities responsible for implementing gender equality policies, plans, and programs. Next slide, please. Just briefly, the, the eight, uh, eight actions that are broadly clustered under the overarching dimensions. This has been um, previously alluded by our speakers, but uh, we'd just like to present that the declaration calls upon governments in Asia and the Pacific with the support of all relevant stakeholders as appropriate to intensify actions to realize women's equal enjoyment of human rights and fundamental freedoms for an equal future by 2030. So um, just presented before you are the eight key actions that are highlighted in the Asia Pacific Declaration on Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment. Next slide, please. At this point, I would like to share um, the, the gendered impacts of COVID-19 in the Fiji context. Um, this is an infographic that was um, part of a, a research conducted by the working group in Fiji that was formed in response to COVID-19. Um, the working group comprised of um, uh, diverse Voices in Action, Diva for Equality in Fiji, Fiji Women's Rights Movement, UN Women, Fiji Multi-Country Office, the Asian Development Bank, and uh, led by the Ministry of Women. Uh, as we can see in this uh, infographic, as I would just like to highlight, that the Fijian government recognizes the gendered impact of COVID-19 and is prioritizing the importance of gender-responsive national recovery plans in fighting the effects. In Fiji, as elsewhere, the economic impacts of COVID-19 are being disproportionately felt by women who earn less than men, have less saved, and work in jobs with little security or protection. These preconditions, coupled with increased unpaid work from additional caring responsibilities and spikes in already high rates of gender-based violence, as we can see in the infographic, whereby 
um, two out of three women in Fiji are being subjected to physical or sexual violence in their lifetime. Um, I mean, the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 on Fijian women and girls will continue well beyond the immediate health crisis. The government of Fiji believes firmly that we are only as strong as the most vulnerable among us. The COVID-19 pandemic brought to our attention the importance and urgency of taking social protection to informal workers, and in particular, building resilience for near poor households who are just above the poverty cutoff and all women and girls and marginalized groups, whilst also supporting micro and small enterprises. This means looking towards broadening our disaster crisis responsive social protection interventions or targets. So we are at present examining the possibility to do so with a human-centered, all women and girls-centered agenda. We are looking into best practices, lessons learned from other countries, and also innovative, inclusive, transformative models to decide what could work for our small island nation. This course of action could prompt, one, development of a national social protection policy framework with an embedded gender transformative disaster resilience responsive component. Second, rollout of policy oriented pilot targeted initiatives and also the Partnership for Greater Transformative Disaster Risk and Resilience Building, Financing and Support. I thank you all for your um, attention and that concludes my presentation. Thank you and Vinakabalevo. Many thanks, uh, Emily, for your excellent and comprehensive overview of the Beijing Plus 25 review outcomes. And also, it's, uh, uh, it's excellent for all of us to see that how Fiji integrate gender into the national response to COVID-19. Thank you very much. So now uh, we have four more speakers on the panel. I would like to ask everyone to stick to the eight minutes um, uh, uh, limit for your presentation so that we can live, uh, uh, keep some time for discussion. Okay, now, um, I would like to invite uh, Miss uh, Christine Rosary uh, Yuvang Chefs, who is the Executive Director uh, of the Philippine Commission on Women. Okay, hold on. Uh, ED Cree, <laughs> as, as, hold on, just, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry for the pause. Uh, I want to just briefly mention that ED Cree, as she's called by many, uh, is a mother, lawyer, business professional, and a women's rights advocate. Her passion to advance women's rights is closely connected with her legal profession. As a lawyer, she handled pro bono cases on violence against women and children and advocated for the gender-sensitive policies, women's entrepreneurship, and protection of women against sexual harassment in the workplace. A decree, please share your reflections. The floor is Thank yours. You. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Our Excellencies, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from the Philippines. Next slide, please. 2020 is a pivotal year for the accelerated realization of gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. Aside from the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, it is also the fifth year implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. However, in this milestone year, we are instead experiencing a global pandemic that threatens the hard-fought gains achieved towards gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. It is this extremely challenging landscape that we must press on to accomplish the full implementation of the BPFA and Sustainable Development Goals. Next, please. In the past five years, significant achievements have been made in the Philippines for women and girls across the overarching dimensions of the BPFA. It is apparent, however, that the COVID-19 pandemic has and will continue to slow down the progress we have made in these areas and has simultaneously caused unprecedented challenges for women and girls everywhere. 
Allow me to discuss how the Philippines has accelerated progress of the BPFA and how we expect the ongoing crisis to affect the implementation of identified prior priority areas for action in healthcare, education, economic participation, social protection, political participation and representation, including in peace processes and environmental conservation, and eliminating violence against women and girls. Next, please. An overarching dimension one, policies on decent work, business and entrepreneurship have improved working conditions of women in the informal and formal sectors and of women migrant workers, such as the expanded maternity leave law, handbook for overseas, overseas Filipino Workers Act, Domestic Workers Act, and Go Negotio or Go Business Act. For women farmers, specialized capacity building and provision of production inputs, including women-friendly equipment and post-harvest facilities, have helped improve agricultural productivity. The Philippines has also supported programs and services to recognize, reduce, and reduce, redistribute unpaid care and domestic work. COVID-19 has immobilized both the formal and informal economies, with women in the informal sector, migrant workers, and micro-entrepreneurs among the hardest hit. Lockdowns and school closures have put additional strain on women working at home as they carry an already disproportionate burden of unpaid care and domestic work. Prevailing high income inequality may be exacerbated and informal workers are at risk of being left behind in social amelioration fund, uh, programs. Next, please. An overarching dimension two. Next, please. Thank you. To promote displaced and disadvantaged women's access to decent work, livelihood, and emergency employment programs were implemented from 2014 to 2019, including for returning women migrant workers. Women micro-entrepreneurs who comprise the majority of MSMEs in the Philippines were provided financial and mentorship support. The Philippines also strengthened its conditional transfer program to be more inclusive and comprehensive and introduced unconditional transfers for more indigent beneficiaries. Strong legislation on health care and sexual and reproductive health and rights such as the Universal Health Care Act, Responsible Parenthood and Reproductive Health Act, Attaining and Sustaining Zero and Met Need for Modern Family Planning and First 100 Days Law has increased access to health services for women and girls. Next, please. The updating of K-12 curriculum to, com to meet comprehensive sexual education standards and implementation of free technical and vocational education and training for universal access to quality education have resulted in improved educational outcomes and skills for women and girls. Presently, services and facilities meant for sexual and reproductive health care are at risk of being deprioritized as the number of COVID-19 cases continue to rise. It is imperative that sexual and reproductive health care services continue to be provided to women and girls despite quarantine and isolation measures in place. Another major challenge for the country is the continuation of education for learners at all levels in a safe and accessible manner through strategies such as blended and remote learning. Next, please. An overarching dimension three, notable policies on eliminating violence against women and girls were enacted including the Anti-Male Order Spouse Act and Safe Spaces Act, established committees on anti-trafficking and anti vouse development of a strategic action plan against trafficking, collaborative action with youth and civil society organizations, and continuous awareness campaigns have contributed to combating gender-based violence and abuse and has helped the Philippines maintain its tier one ranking in the 2020 Trafficking in Persons Report. Next, please. An overarching dimension four, 
programs have been implemented to improve women's and girls' access to information and communication technologies, especially in rural and remote areas where only 60% of women have access to the internet. The Philippines and other partners launched the Women ICT Frontier Initiative and the Women Empowerment ICT that aim to empower Filipinos with strong economic and digital literacy skills. Access to technology is especially important, important now more than ever in the new normal where digital methods are favored over physical interactions. Women and girls in rural and remote areas are at higher risk of falling further behind in terms of availing social services, especially health and education, as they have the least resources and access to technology. Next, please. An overarching dimension five, the Philippines developed the third generation of its National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security for 2017 to 2022 broadening the framework for addressing the situation of women in armed conflict and their contributions to conflict trans transformation. Additionally, the country supported women's participation in the peace process, such as that of hijab troopers and Professor Miriam Coronel Ferrer, the chief negotiator of the comprehensive agreement on the Bank Samoro the first and only female chief negotiator in the world that signed a major peace agreement. Currently, we have an undertaking with UN Women Philippines to conduct the mapping of gender issues and concerns facing the frontline peace and security duty bearers in this time of COVID-19. The objectives are to explore the current and potential gender dimensions of COVID-19 at the perspective of the frontline duty bearers, the peace and security personnel, and to highlight the ways in which women, girls, and other marginalized people are affected by the mitigation and response efforts of the government as observed by the frontliners while on duty. Next, please. On overarching dimension six, the Philippines implemented programs to expand the role of women and youth in shaping environmental protection alongside, alongside issuances of policies for disaster risk reduction, climate resilience and mitigation with gender perspectives such as the Green Jobs Act, enhanced national greening program, and training for women on geological hazards map reading. We recognize that COVID-19 has created new challenges for environmental protection and climate change in the country with the increase in non-biodegradable and infectious waste from PPE use and medical facilities. We will continue to consider possible ways to mitigate the negative effects of the pandemic on our land and oceans. Next, please. Achieving universal health care, inclusive social protection, decent work, women's economic empowerment, quality education, and eliminating VAUSI have acquired new found urgency among, amidst the pandemic. COVID-19 has exacerbated existing inequalities in our society and will have long-lasting adverse effects on the lives of women, children, and other vulnerable groups unless governments do not actively consider their needs in COVID-19 response and recovery. 25 years after the adoption of the BPFA, the Philippines is both honored and committed to remain a part of the conversation on its full and effective implementation, especially in the context of emerging, emerging challenges such as the climate crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, E.D. Cree, uh, for your excellent uh, presentation. And what I think is uh, truly amazing is that you have outlined uh, the key actions uh, by the Philippines in the six thematic areas, very nicely outlining almost all the actions taken and reflecting how the outcomes of Beijing Plus 25 review uh, are being implemented in the Philippines. Uh, I think it's a remarkable example.
And also, I think the way you have uh, uh, blended the, 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 the responses of Philippines uh, to uh, in terms of addressing gender concerns in the context of uh, the COVID-19 crisis give us the confidence that it's possible to turn the crisis into opportunities for continuously promoting gender equality. Thank you, Edi Kree. Now, uh, let me move on to my uh, UN colleague, uh, Ms. Sarah Dutu Valero. She's a regional advisor on gender statistics from a UN Women Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Sarah manages the flagship initiative entitled Making Every Woman and Girl Count. And she provides technical support to enhance the quality, availability, and the use of gender statistics across Asia and the Pacific. So at this session, Sarah will share with us the research findings on the gender impact of COVID-19. Sarah, please. Thank you so much, Tai Tai, and thank you so much to, to all ESCAP colleagues for uh, inviting us to, to be here today. Um, and thank you all for connecting online. So it's uh, really nice to be here. So I'll just jump straight in, into um, the results of Unlocking the Lockdown, which is a publication that we recently put out um, to assess the, the consequences of COVID-19. Next slide, please. Um, so, as all of you know, COVID-19 got to Asia first. So soon after the pandemic was uh, declared, we started wondering, like, how is this going to affect men and women differently? So we started thinking, you know, are women and men losing their jobs? Um, are people spending more time teaching their children now that everybody's staying at home? Um, are the vulnerable groups getting poorer or are uh, women and men protected by health insurance? So we wanted answers to all these questions. And that's why we decided to launch uh, a wide ranging survey. Next slide, please. So um, in order uh, to make sure that we had full control over our survey and that we could keep the confidentiality of our data, we designed our own survey interface. So we programmed our own survey, um, also because this allowed us to, uh, to create pretty sophisticated questionnaire logic. Um, and then we partnered with mobile network operators across the region to launch the survey through text message. Why text message? Because that allowed us to keep control for samples and apply statistical weights afterwards. Um, and then once people received the text message and filled out the survey, um, the data would go into our own database, again, keeping full confidentiality of, the whole of, the, of all the results and, and keeping ownership of the whole survey process. Next, please. Um, so really, uh, our survey uh, targeted random samples of men and women uh, phone users um, across the region. Uh, we ended up having between 1,000 and 8,000 responses per country. So those are pretty large samples. And because we um, had control over our samples, we were able to apply weights to adjust our samples for sex, age, and educational attainment differentials. Um, the questions and classifications in our questionnaire were in line with international statistical standards for sake of comparability. And uh, the SMS distribution in some countries was complemented with voice or face-to-face -face surveys um, for areas that were a little bit remote and where uh, maybe not as many women would have access to phone phones. Um, and we did this, like I said, in partnership with national governments, the private sector, and other international organizations in select countries. So if you would ask me what's the key finding from our survey, I would probably tell you that COVID-19 may be putting the achievement of the 2030 agenda at stake in Asia and the Pacific, especially for women and girls. So our survey was really multidisciplinary and we saw effects in every single one of the goals for women and girls. So today we don't have time to go through each of the goals, so I'll just pick and choose some of the key results. Um, next slide, please. So as you can see here, um, this is about health. So because COVID-19 is first and foremost a health uh, emergency, right? But what we see typically from health data is that more men are dying than women, which is true. Um, but we 
often forget to look at things such as mental health. So when we actually look at mental health, we see that in all the countries across the region, um, women's mental health uh, is worse than men's as a result of COVID-19. So women are suffering higher rates of stress and anxiety. And this is particularly true for younger women. So women younger than 25 years old. When you look at physical health, we also see that um, women since the spread of COVID-19 have had more physical health issues. So this doesn't necessarily mean that they caught the virus, but just any physical health related issues. But this is very relevant because when we ask people whether they're able to see a doctor, we also see that women are having more challenges seeing a doctor since the spread of COVID-19, waiting longer hours at the doctor, and having more challenges purchasing medical supplies. So significant challenges. Next slide, please. Um, we also ask a number of questions around unpaid care and domestic work. Um, uh, and we saw that since the pandemic, everybody's kind of stuck at home and therefore the domestic and care workload has increased substantially. So when we ask people whether they spend more time, everybody reported increases, both men and women. However, we see that women overall are reporting more increases than men in both unpaid care and domestic work. So this is on top of the fact that women were already doing four times as much unpaid care and domestic work than men globally, and they're still reporting more increases. Um, and the differences are particularly noticeable when we ask people whether they're doing at least three related activities to unpaid care and domestic work, there's where we see the bigger gaps. Next slide, please. Um, so COVID-19, like I said, is, is uh, obviously affecting the social dimensions of sustainable development, like, like we have seen, but it's also affecting the, the economic and environmental dimensions of sustainable development. So in our survey, we see that 23% of the people told us that their water source had been compromised since the spread of COVID-19. Um, so this uh, is pushing people to find different water sources, which may be further or maybe more difficult to access. And we see that both men and women are reporting uh, increases in time spent collecting water and firewood since the spread of COVID-19. Um, there are differences by sex, but in some countries, it's women that are spending more time, and in some countries, it's men that are spending more time. Next slide, please. Um, and obviously, we see that COVID-19 has had significant uh, consequences on the labor market. Uh, so what we see very clearly is that uh, people in formal jobs are working less hours and we're seeing reductions in paid from formal jobs and this is particularly true for women uh, so women may have to maybe take care of the children at home may have to maybe uh, perhaps are not able to take public transit to go to work etc so they are seeing significant reductions in paid work time um, when it comes to informal jobs then both men and women are losing their jobs um, when we look at, at the regional aggregates for all of Asia and the Pacific, we say that women are losing their jobs a little bit faster than men in informal jobs, but there are differences by country. Next slide, please. Um, people in cities are facing also significant challenges, uh, a bit different from, from people in rural areas. So when we look at, for instance, whether people have found disruptions in public transit, uh, women in capital cities are, are more likely to say that the disruptions in public transit has affected, have affected them as compared to men. Women are also noting that uh, their health routines are being affected um, as a result of the lockdowns, et cetera. Next slide, please. And uh, then I'll be remiss if we didn't talk about the shadow pandemic, so uh, violence against women. So because our survey was multidisciplinary, we didn't ask specific questions about violence against women because for women who are uh, at home with their abusers, this would have put their, their safety at stake. Um, so this, comes, this, this slide here comes from a separate survey uh, that was run among civil society organizations, service providers for victims of violence. So this doesn't come from the victims themselves. Uh, but we see that uh, for about 40% of the respondents, they see that they say that they have received more cases of violence from family members since the spread of the virus, um, followed closely by violence from employers. So a lot of perhaps domestic workers that are, that are uh, confined at home, uh, et cetera. Um, and this is particularly worrisome because many of the organizations, so 71% of the civil society organization service providers said that they're now operating only partially and 12% said that they have suspended the service completely. Um, so again, this is quite worrisome. So I'll leave it at that. Um, if you want to see the results across all the goals, next slide, please, then you can, uh, you can find more in the link uh, that's included here. 
in um, in on you and women's uh, data hub thank you thank you very much sarah for your very uh, succinct a uh, yet informative presentation with the uh, concrete, we talked a lot about gender impact and you really bring the data and give us clear evidence on how it impacts livelihood, job security, health, social well-being of women. Thank you. This lays a good foundation for our further discussion, not only for this session and for the entire uh, meeting. Really appreciate it. So now I have the pleasure to invite uh, Ms. Gita Sen uh, to uh, make her intervention. Perhaps most of you know Gita, who is a veteran and a gender, gender champion. She has worked for 35 years on um, population policies, reproductive and sexual health, gender equality, and women's human rights, as well as broad issues concerning poverty, human development, and the labor markets. And she's a distinguished professor and director with the Public Health Foundation of India and adjunct professor of global health and population at Harvard University. She's also, perhaps you all know, the general coordinator of Dong and a member of the independent uh, accountability panel for the UNSG's strategy on every woman, every child, every adolescent. So now uh, we will invite Gita to share her views on key drivers to accelerate gender equality in the UN decade of action. Gita, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, uh, Chai Chai. Um, uh, let me also thank uh, through you, UNSCAP and UN Women for giving me the opportunity to present some remarks in this meeting. Um, good morning. Um, colleagues and friends, good afternoon to those who are further east than where I am. Um, in this strange time of the pandemic, we've seen very quickly that advances towards gender equality in our region are real, but limited, and also built on all too flimsy foundations. Why do I say this? Before I go to that, let me just uh, put in a couple of caveats to that. I was delighted to hear the previous presentations, everything from um, the mention of EPIC, Every Policy is Connected by Dr. Tata, the um, sophistication of the UN Women Survey, to hear the Fiji Ministry's speaker, Emily, uh, emphasize social protection for women, to hear the Philippine speaker from the Commission on Women emphasize the interconnections with sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, all of these tell us that not only in the practice of policies, but in our thinking as well, um, towards the interconnections of gender equality, we've made significant progress. And yet, our foundations are still relatively fragile. And I will say why that is the case and argue that the pandemic has really shown us a, a few things about where we critically need to build and strengthen. There were a couple of reasons that the Beijing Platform for Action 25 years ago was so path-breaking. One of them was its basis in human rights. Human rights were not just one of the 12 critical areas of concern, but in fact, the connecting tissue for all 12. Without a rights-based approach, it was clear that our actions, our policies would be narrow and limited. And that connective tissue, in fact, linked not only the 12 critical areas of concern, but linked the Beijing Platform for Action to Rio, Vienna, and Cairo that preceded the Beijing Conference and the UN uh, Social Development Conference that followed Beijing, not to mention Habitat. It's very important that we retain our links to, through this connecting tissue 
because otherwise our advances can be fragile. The second critical reason is that as much as we've tried to advance in the region, one of our problems towards reducing gender inequality and advancing women's human rights, we've been a little bit in the position of trying to mop the floor with the faucet, the tap turned fully on. And that faucet has been the faucet of rising economic inequality in the region, which makes for a very toxic combination with pre-existing and long-standing social inequalities of gender, of caste, of ethnicity and race, of um, LGBTI status, disability status. There's a range of social inequalities that continue to exist in our region and make for a toxic combination when they are combined with rising social and economic inequality. Those two cha huge challenges, I think, remain with us. And they are the reason why our advances are face so many barriers and why they are limited. Let me just say how I think the pandemic has shown us uh, these limitations. Previous speakers have emphasized some of this, and so I will just very quickly highlight them. The fact that weak health systems prior to uh, the pandemic combine with socioeconomic inequality to make health services much more limited, the, uh, the um, reduction in access to maternal health services adolescent health services, child health services, as well as SRHR services, including access to safe abortion services, are all point to the fact that if we don't work towards long-term long -term strengthening of health services, we cannot in fact make progress in these areas that will be sustained. This is true not just for health services, but when we look at all of the 12 areas of concern of Beijing, education, um, access, and so on. The second one is that within health services, women health workers tend to be at the bottom of the hierarchy. That means when it comes to access to PPE, and one of the things that is emerging now is that women health workers may have access to PPEs, but when policy programs don't pay attention to the fact that a PPE equipment takes as much as 45 minutes to put on. And when a woman may be menstruating, that becomes a nightmare. And so women are challenged in this way in ways that we are not adequately recognizing. Menstrual health for adolescents and women is a critical aspect of their ability to work and participate fully in the workplace. The third is that, and many speakers have mentioned this, heavily, women are heavily present as informal workers and migrant workers. And this is, in terms of policies and how we address them is a kind of now you see them, now you don't. And all too often, this, the challenges faced by informal and migrant workers have been far too invisible in the region. And the fourth and fifth, which I won't emphasize because many speakers have, is the rising responsibility for unpaid care work and the silent epidemic of violence against women. What does this mean for us in terms of where we go in the next, um, in the next decade? One is human rights and inequality have to be central to how we think about epic policies, the larger context of policies, whether it is macroeconomic, fiscal and tax justice policies, or whether it is policies towards sectors other than the ones that we traditionally think of 
as being women transformative or women responsive. Second, intersectional inequality and the role of intersectional inequality. We need to directly address the challenges of intersectional inequality for work and survival and for participation. The third is the critical importance of gender norms. And here we need to think about the role of older women and of boys. We paid far a lot of attention to girls and, and girls particularly in changing gender norms. We haven't paid enough attention to the role of older women in reinforcing unequal gender norms. Um, in this context, policies are not all. We know that Beijing plus 25 faces some critical institutional and funding challenges. The funding challenges have pushed gender institutions and gender policies into the arms of the private for-profit sector without adequate controls, regulations, and sometimes even understanding of the implications for gender equality. And I think we need to pay far greater attention to the relevance and importance of the private sector including its regulation for gender equality and for human rights overall. We need to understand that women's machineries need to be strengthened much more than they have been, and particularly emphasize the catalytic role of, the civil, of civil society organizations, of feminist and women's, women's organizations, that function as society's conscience keepers for gender equality and women's human rights. I thank you. Sorry. Um, thank you very much, Gita. It's always a great joy to hear you. Uh, you give us so much food for thought in a short time. Uh, you have positioned the gender issues in the overarching social economic inequalities, bringing many issues, including health and paid care work, violence against women, and all these persistent gender uh, inequalities, uh, and highlighting the importance of addressing large context of macroeconomic policies, inter intersectionalities, gender norms, and the, the need to empower women's machineries and women's organizations. So indeed, this will set the tone for our discussion, not only for today, but also for tomorrow and for the in, entire uh, session of the EGM. Thank you very much, Gita. Now, uh, let me move to our uh, final speaker for this panel, uh, Ms. Uh, Lani, La, Lanini Singh. She's the executive director with the Fiji Women's Rights Movement. Lalini is a feminist and a social development specialist with over 20 years experience in design, implementation, management, monitoring, and evaluation of women's rights and development programs in Asia Pacific. Her particular interest is on the issues of women's sexual and reproductive health and rights, decent work, and organizational capacity strengthening. Uh, Lalini will share the CSO perspectives on the key priorities in the context of Beijing Plus 25 review. The floor is yours, Lalini. Thank you, uh, Chai Chai um, and uh, colleagues. It's an honor to be part of this um, expert group meeting and um, you know, for this particular session to provide the CSO perspectives. Um, indeed, a very uh, hard act to follow with um, um, such amazing speakers, uh, but I take my cue from um, Gita, um, where she said that feminist organizations and women's uh, rights organizations are society's conscious, uh, conscience um, keepers for gender equality. So as such, um, I will attempt to provide some responses to the uh, four questions that were posed earlier on. Um, foremostly, um, let me say thank you to ESCAP and UN Women for keeping um, this conversation ongoing um, in a very challenging year in all fronts. 
However, you know, women's organizations, as usual, are at the forefront, working shoulder to shoulder with all stakeholders to ensure that the recovery and the um, building up efforts in every country affected by COVID-19 is done with women at the center. Just as thousands of women who had gathered in Beijing 25 years ago, um, women uh, are again the galvanizing force, uh, forces now. Um, this is not easy given the myriad of complexities um, each country has. Um, moving to the questions that I had, um, the next steps in realizing um, the goals set in the Beijing Plus 25 Declaration must be based on a firm recognition on the realities that did not lead us to achieving the Beijing goals in the first 25 years. What uh, have been the key barriers to achieving those and systematically addressing those um, at all levels? Commitments alone, uh, even though a very noteworthy achievement in our region, will not bring about the change we want. We need an enormous boost in the political will of all states and stakeholders who right now seem to be paying uh, lip service to the issues of women's rights and gender equality. Policy and legislative changes are a start, but these need to be backed up with resources to ensure that the accompanying accountable action and work plans are implemented, monitored, and adjusted to suit context. Women must be a part of all decision-making and must have a stake in what needs to be done. Um, for them, with them, an inclusive approach must be taken so that no woman is left behind. We need to remember that the Asia-Pacific intergovernmental processes that led to this declaration did not recognize civil society as equal partners in the process of its development, change and contributions to the outcome document. We were in fact locked out of the discussions and the outcome document in the end did not fully commit itself to advancing the diverse women and women's and girls' human rights or recognition of the urgency of the climate crisis and emergency, especially for the Pacific. So what's needed right now um, is the commitment from governments to listen to women's voices. In fact, over 400 feminist organizations from all over the world have put together a feminist declaration on Beijing at 25, and we urge you to turn our demands into action now. Achieving the SDGs by 2030, well, in my opinion, that is a pipe dream for us now. The SDGs were never about a rights-based approach to development, but as commitments go, and we still have to, if we still have to divert our precious resources into achieving the SDG targets in the next decade, then my suggestion would be for all accelerated actions to be women and people-centered, formulated with women's um, civil society, uh, organizations' meaningful in, uh, involvement, they must use intersectional analysis to map out the differentiated impacts on vulnerable groups that are already affected by the intersecting powers of globalization, fundamentalism, militarism, and patriarchy. It is clearly evident that the structural barriers to women's human rights and gender equality need to be removed as the first steps. Each and every action should also address specific structural issues that are deeply affecting people's lives in the region, including the climate crisis, the crisis in our democracies, neoliberal economic and trade policies, pushing countries into debt, amongst others. The solution is pretty clear based on the Beijing commitments, including strengthening public services, um, universal social protection, shifting economic and physical policies to reduce inequalities of resources and power and wealth within and between countries and between men and women. The COVID pandemic and gender equality. Well, instead of seeing the COVID pandemic as a threat to the progress that we have made, we perhaps should consider it as a portal that has revealed and exacerbated pre-existing structural and intersectional inequalities. In this context, we urge everyone to take actions that truly address the structural barriers to the advancement of women's human rights and define gender equality, as well as women's, uh, women's empowerment in the framework of feminist de development justice. When we speak about partnerships and collaboration, um, women's human rights and gender equality 
is a question about power. And therefore, partnership and other initiatives must aim at shifting power relations for women and girls in all their diversities to hold power inherent to them as right holders, to make decisions over their own bodies, communities, and the planet. For any partnership to work, it requires courage and critical reflection to recognize our own power within, to exercise and impart that that power to others. There is also a need for the recognition of historical and systemic oppression, exclusion, and marginalization of others, um, and an action to redistribute power, wealth, and opportunities. A real partnership lies with women in their communities with power to affect changes from local to the global levels. A couple of examples I'd like to mention here. One is of the Asia Pacific Regional Civil Society Engagement Mechanism, or APRSEM. And that this group has shown the power of organized cross constituencies and movements with a shared vision and commitment to the development justice uh, and led by feminist uh, movements, APRSEM generates um, the recognition of structural barriers to sustainable development and has institutionalized the participation of civil society, particularly grassroots in the SDG processes. Second uh, is what we see now, um, and Emily mentioned this in, in her presentation earlier on, in most countries of the region, in response to COVID-19, there have been many gender working groups formed to address the intensely increased gender-based violence situation or to provide the much needed gender perspectives and analysis on how diverse women will be impacted by COVID-19. These working groups, as the one in Fiji, comprises of representatives from the National Women's Machinery, women's rights organizations, gender experts, and UN agencies. And, and we in Fiji, who are part of the um, COVID response gender working group, worked for weeks pro bono to put together our analysis uh, which was done as early as um, in, in April 2020. Governments must exercise regulatory power over corporations as outlined in the Beijing commitments to reject public and private partnerships, which has been promoted under the guise of multi-stakeholder partnerships and to expand public, public partnerships to realize government's human rights obligations as duty bearers and people's sovereignty as rights holders. To end, for partnerships and collaboration, the situation, the crisis of multilateralism must be addressed. We must address the increased and complicated issues of meaningful participation of civil society um, that we see now due to uh, digital divide, lack of information access, et cetera. Um, as you know, it, it was experienced at, at HLPF this year. Um, as well as looking at, you know, funding crisis uh, to sustain the work, the very important work done by the Office of the High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights. And maybe this is a space where we also talk about the importance of strengthening the resources um, that are available, um, you know, for the women's movements um, and not to reduce it or to divert it at this particular time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lalini. Uh, really appreciate uh, your uh, sharing of CSO perspectives and suggestions and frank feedback. And we appreciate the fact that the intergovernmental meetings has its own you know, uh, challenges, constraints, and restrictions, both at the global level and the regional level. And uh, we are reflecting also along the way how to ensure uh, when we are uh, organizing meetings, how to, the, uh, to, to, uh, to our best capacity to ensure CSO perspectives are reflected. Hence, uh, perhaps you can see that as a result of uh, that effort together with our UN Women colleagues, uh, for this EGM, we have ensured a large number of uh, CSO participants. And also um, your suggestion on how we better utilize or continue to fully utilize the issue Pacific civil society engagement mechanism uh, in both our gender meetings as well as broader uh, forums on sustainable development is uh, truly valuable. 
And finally, indeed, uh, the, the partnership of CSO and uh, government is symbiotic. It's not just for civil society. It is to the benefit of government. We will continue as the UN to our part to foster that collaboration and partnership in everything we do and also uh, uh, ask for your support along the way. And indeed, there is a long way to go. Thank you very much for, for sharing your perspectives and valuable suggestions. So ladies and gentlemen, we have heard from our great panel with wonderful speakers for sharing their perspectives and insights. We have a few minutes. Um, I'd like to open the floor for questions want to check with uh, my colleague, uh, Shane, is there any specific questions for our panelists? So far, we haven't received any in the chat box. Okay. So since we haven't seen any uh, specific questions and uh, comments uh, uh, that require interventions at this point, and uh, indeed I'm reaching the, uh, the end of uh, session one, uh, I will uh, perhaps now uh, conclude this session and hand over to our MC for proceeding to the next panel. And if uh, we perhaps, uh, I think our participants are reflecting on the specific issues and then we will have ample uh, opportunities for raising questions and providing inputs and comments uh, in the next three sessions. Uh, over to you, MC. Thank you very much, Chai Chai, and for concluding the first session of our meeting. We will now move into session number two on women's economic empowerment. Uh, this session will offer perspectives on challenges and opportunities to enhance women's economic empowerment, including in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. The session is going to be moderated by Ms. Joni Simpson, she is the Senior Specialist on Gender Equality and Non-Discrimination for East and Southeast Asia and the Pacific for the International Labour Organization. She has more than 20 years of experience promoting women's leadership and women's entrepreneurship. In her current role, Ms. Simpson provides technical guidance and support on gender equality, non-discrimination, and women's economic empowerment approaches to ILO constituents and partners for policies and programs relating to gender inclusion and non-discrimination in the world of work. She is also joined by Ms. Chai Chai, who will firstly provide a brief overview presentation to this meeting. May I please ask Ms. Chai Chai first to take the floor and welcome Ms. Joni Simpson to the meeting. Thank you, should I, um, okay, let me turn on the right video. Okay, so, um, okay. I will do a very, very brief introduction because we have excellent speakers for this panel and they each bring their unique perspective and experience in addressing different dimensions of women's economic empowerment. So I will just go over a few uh, broad issues concerning uh, women's economic empowerment. Uh, as you can see from these slides, uh, there are some key factors we need to consider when we talk about women's economic empowerment. Their access to property, assets, financial services, their access to social protection, opportunities for education, skills enhancement, training, and overall, all this on the line, their opportunities for earning decent income, decent jobs, right? And we, we also needed to consider the overarching issues in terms of uh, time poverty, which concerns women across the sectors at every level and how this restricts their economic participation, their advancement in terms of career. And perhaps very importantly, we needed to consider women's representation and collective action because piecemeal change wouldn't last. We need that collective power from women to generate a movement to shake the system. Very briefly, I want to just show you the next slide. 
in terms of the current uh, situation, in terms of, can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, the, okay. So, women's labor force participation, very clearly, is way behind men. Okay, so over 30% of gender gap. This is totally unacceptable. And this is only a tiny uh, reflection of gender gaps in terms of economic empowerment. And there are many factors behind these gaps, whether it's uh, the unpaid care work, whether it's uh, the overarching structural issues in the economic system, and whether it's our policy framework, all this needs to come into play to reduce the gender gaps. Okay, move to the next slide, please. And also equally concerning is while women are working, for those who are working, you will find the majority of them are in the informal sector. 36%, only 36%, one third of women who are working are in the formal sector with some sort of perhaps decent income, not all of them, but some. And almost, you know, for those, the entire women population working in formal sector, they don't have access to social protection. And when there is a situation of COVID or other crisis, they were not only stripped of income, they were stripped of all other protection. So this is a very important issue for, for us to consider how to empower women economically. Move to the next slide, please. Another critical input issue we needed to address through this session uh, is the unpaid care work because women simply don't have time to participate, whether it's in economic activities, leisure, or political participation. And you can see in Asia Pacific, women work the longest hour compared with the world average. When you add up both the time for paid work and unpaid work, and they work three times more than men, when it comes to unpaid care work. Next slide, please. So I've, I have showed you just a few slides highlighting some symptoms. How do we address these issues? And how we, do we address the underlying factors behind these symptoms? These are going to uh, be the focus of this session. But I want to briefly highlight some of the key recommendations already laid out in the Beijing uh, Plus 25 outcome document. In terms of enhancing women's labor force participation, while we uh, pay attention to the workplace issue, the overall enabling environment, gender parity in the workplace, we must also look at additional opportunities including enhancing women's entrepreneur entrepreneurship and what role private sector can play in that context. We also have to look at the overarching macroeconomic policies as Gita has mentioned earlier, and how do we create that enabling environment for women to utilize their talent and potential to be the, uh, the women entrepreneurs and to be leaders in all the sectors. Now, the, how do we address the informal work? ILO has done a lot in this, but this is an area with a tremendous challenges. Many governments are struggling with ways to do this. Your perspective, your suggestions will be truly valuable to us. But so the key strategy in facility, facilitating transition from formal to, in, to, to, from informal to formal is vital here. And related that women will be able to benefit from legal and social protection uh, if they are able to move into the formal sector. And finally, we must address unpaid care work, both through promoting the equal share of unpaid care work at home, and also through government action, policies and programs to invest in the care economy, invest in quality care services and care-related infrastructures, 
And in that process, not only we liberate women from unpaid care work and generate a lot of decent job opportunities. I will stop here and hand over back to the moderator of this session. Junie, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chai Chai. Distinguished participants, it's a pleasure to take part in this uh, event. And we have a very exciting panel uh, of presentations and discussants. So I will go right into it. And I would like to first call upon uh, Ms. Yam Kumari Katiwada, Secretary, Ministry of Women, Children and Senior Citizens from uh, Nepal. She is currently the Secretary at the Ministry of Women, Children, Senior Citizens. She's been serving for more than 24 years in various capacities within the government. Prior to her current appointment, she was the Secretary at the Ministry of Industry, Commerce and Supplies dealing with the policy issues of the industrial sector under various responsibilities. And without further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, Madam Secretary. Would you like to take the floor? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, distinguished delegates, from member state of UNISCAP and UN Women, civil societies, ladies and gentlemen. I express my sincere appreciation to UNISCAP and UN Women for organizing this expert uh, group meeting despite of this unfavorable situation and providing me this opportunity to share the status of uh, Nepal and especially uh, the initiatives towards gender equality and women's economic empowerment. So I have prepared some uh, achievements, uh, some slides covering overall achievements uh, towards gender equality uh, and women's empowerment. But I will focus to the economic uh, empowerment of women um, as because of this uh, time constraint. And, uh, and I will also focus a little bit um, about this uh, COVID uh, impact and response. Uh, actually, uh, our constitution of Nepal is uh, very progressive, democratic, inclusive towards gender equality and empowerment, which has provisioned uh, many um, fundamental rights uh, for women and uh, some of the participation it has guaranteed even in the constitution. Uh, so uh, I'll just skip this uh, slide. Uh, this is only the provision of a uh, constitution. So could you please uh, go to the next slide? So I just uh, want to um, move to the uh, political representation. Uh, so if we see the political representation in federal parliament is 33%. So could you please move to the another slide? Next slide. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, state assembly, in state assembly, there is 34% of uh, women participation and in local level assembly is 41%. This is really encouraging. And uh, we have um, uh, more than 90% deputy mayor or vice uh, chair of local government. And out of uh, 16 uh, women chairperson in federal parliament, uh, parliamentary committee, we have nine of them are women. Uh, similarly, if we see uh, the next slide, please. Uh, this is the employment and uh, professional scenario of uh, Nepalese women. Uh, this is a um, um, uh, figure. Uh, in different sectors, civil service, we have 26%, health professional, and doctors, engineers, journalists, small and large entrepreneurs, um, enterprises, it is 37%, uh, and labor force participation and cooperatives. Uh, this is just, um, I want to highlight uh, this, how uh, is the participation of women in governmental and non-governmental non sector is increasing uh, encouragingly. 
so if we see the sectoral achievements, next, next slide, please. Uh, I just want to go uh, just two indicators, uh, gender, um, uh, gender parity index in secondary education is uh, 1.037. And um, net uh, enrollment rate of girls at primary level is 97%. Uh, similarly, in health sector, uh, maternal mot mortality rate at 239 and child mortality rate 39, um, 39 per 100,000 like birth. So this is also uh, decreasing. This is also very much in uh, encouraging. Now let me move to the uh, COVID impact, which has been impacted uh, mostly to our um, protection cluster and uh, uh, who, the people who are in safety net, especially women, children, senior citizen, and uh, people uh, with different ability. Uh, impact, um, it has impacted on reproductive health care of women, domestic and gender-based violence, a loss of job inside the country and foreign employment, problem in mental health, psychosocial and suicide cases, problem in livelihood due to financial crisis, impact in, in child education, uh, so, so on. These are uh, some of the major impact. So uh, I would like to move to the uh, response to COVID. So we have a steering committee with plan of action at federal, provincial, and local level um, in, in all level of government and ministry is leading the protection cluster. So could you please move to the another slide? Uh, ministry is leading the protection cluster uh, with the coordination and collaboration of other stakeholders. National and international non-governmental organization and civil societies have been mobilized in coordination with local government to response the impact of COVID-19 up to the community level. Gender response guidelines to response COVID has been formulated and it is in implementation. Community, community psychosocial counselors have been mobilized in all provinces and uh, even in the local level and up to the community, distributing dignity kits, organizing awareness programs, uh, and similarly on um, awareness program and information on safety measures of COVID-19 and against the gender-based violence during the COVID has been disseminated up to the community level with the coordination of a local level government. And rapid gender assessment has been done, JC checklist prepared, and we have also monitored the quarantine and service centers jointly with UN agency. So could you please move to another slide? So I, I will jump to the Initiative for Women's Economic Empowerment. So I would like to request to move to that slide. So the next slide, yes, thank you. Uh, <coughs> we have a, a provision by law that uh, we, uh, women owned industry will get 35% of rebate in industry registration and 20% in, in intellectual property registration establishment of separate women's entrepreneurship development fund, income tax rebate for 10 years for women micro entrepreneurs, dedicated center to facilitate women entrepreneurs in each local level is in, is in the process of establishment, livelihood program at local level is in implementation, complete package of entrepreneurship program is in local level is being implemented with the provision of 70% women beneficiary, Technology support and seed money is being provided to start their business. Start of fund from different organizations is being implemented to support women's entrepreneurs. As most of the women entrepreneurs in Nepal are involving in SMEs, dedicated industrial villages are being established to cluster them. And a dedicated exhibition center for women's entrepreneurs product is in um, process of establishment. So next slide, please. Now I would like to move to the economic relief package uh, to respond this uh, COVID. Uh, actually government has declared recently very stimulated and uh, attractive uh, economic package. This is, this is for all entrepreneurs and especially focusing the tourism industry and the MSMEs. 
Uh, so this is uh, and for women and men entrepreneurs. Uh, there is a long list actually. Uh, it's very good package. Uh, I'll just read some of them. A fund worth of um, 50 billion of badly um, for badly affected sectors, especially tourism and MSMEs, for loans with the minimum interest rate to revive and paying staff salary. Rescue package through monetary policy to mitigate the economic effects of COVID-19 for relief and revive of the various sectors has been declared, focusing on reduce, refinance, and restructuring, 3R, the loans. Uh, so there are long lists. So I would like to request the organizer to share this uh, slide, but I would not um, read this all because this is very long, uh, long list. So I'd like to skip this slide. Uh, so could you please uh, move to the another slide? There are, there are three, yes. Challenges and problem. Yeah, there are three slides. Uh, the uh, only focused the economic, uh, you know, the incentive, uh, especially to reactivate the economic activities which have been badly affected to the uh, by the COVID. So um, challenges and problems uh, uh, to cope with gender issue is institutionalization and mainstreaming the gender issue in all level of government and lack of adequate education and awareness, unemployment and poverty, and discrimination and violence and harm practice in the society are some of the problems and challenges to tackle with the gender issue. Inadequate coordination among the three levels of government for joint campaign in such issues. Tackling with the uh, pandemics, uh, as every sector is affected um, by this uh, pandemic, it's very difficult to tackle. And also uh, responding the psychosocial impact as women, children, senior citizens, and different level people are affected mostly by this pandemic. And to revive the economy and uh, resource generation is also another problem. And lack of desegregated data is also one problem to issue the policy. Uh, to, to overcome these all uh, issues uh, for gender equality and empowerment. Uh, could you please move to the another slide? I have just uh, last slide. Yes, uh, so way forward to overcome these issues uh, for gender equality and uh, women empowerment. And the government, especially the ministry is uh, working with uh, the four pillars of strategies. Uh, um, institutionalization and mainstreaming uh, of international uh, commitment uh, through its policies, plan, program, and budget in all levels of government. Because uh, Nepal is uh, recently moving to um, federal structure um, from its uh, unitary structure. So it's really challenging to uh, mainstreaming these all issues to all level of government. And uh, our uh, another focus is uh, to protect uh, the people who are uh, within the safety net uh, so through rescue, relief, and rehabilitation. Uh, and uh, uh, another important uh, pillar is uh, empowerment. It is uh, basically economic empowerment uh, so through in generation of employment, self-employment, um, livelihood program, and uh, entrepreneurship and quality health and education and uh, response to pandemics. That is now we are facing um, the problem of uh, COVID-19. And we are going to um, carry on these all strategies, strategies with cooperation and co coordination with all level of government, especially uh, with the local level government uh, and international and international non-governmental organizations uh, and development partners and so on. So I'll end this uh, presentation, and if uh, there is some queries and uh, questions, I'll get you back. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Katibada. Very good opening uh, presentation, um, discussing uh, the many initiatives that you have ongoing, but also the need for integrated approach with all of the levels involved. Um, Regarding uh, the importance of women's leadership, 
uh, the advancements you've made on education and health of women and girls and the various responses with a very strong focus there on uh, micro and small enterprises across very many of the most hardest hit sectors that women are working in. Thank you for that. And I'd like to encourage people to start putting their questions in the chat box for our speakers. We'll be coming to them uh, in, a, in a minute. And thank you so much. Now uh, I'll move on to the next presentation, which is around the care economy and women's economic participation. We're asking speakers to uh, stick to the eight minutes, please, if you could. And for this uh, session, actually for this particip particular particip uh, pres presentation, we have two speakers. So to start with, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Deepta Chopra, Research Fellow of the Institute of Development Studies. She is a feminist social scientist leading IDS's work on women's empowerment and unpaid care. Her research interests primarily focus on the empowerment of women and girls and its core links with their paid work and unpaid care work. She has developed and implemented several research projects on the politics of policy processes and gendered political economy analysis of women's economic empowerment programs and policies. Deepta has worked extensively on the Mahamatma Gami, um, sorry, Gandhi Food Rights Act in India. She works closely with state and non-state partners in South Asia and has had high impact in policy and practice in international development, and in particular, relation to our work on the care economy and MGNREGA. With her is Ms. Minakshi Krishnan, sorry if I'm uh, chopping your names, organization development consultant and doctoral researcher for the Institute of Development Studies. Ms. Krishnan works in the areas of gendered political economy, women's empowerment, and social protection. Her particular research interests are exploring the links between paid care and unpaid care work, gendered division of unpaid care, and impact of family-friendly policies on gender relations. She's co-authored evidence-based briefs and working papers on family-friendly policies and women's interactions between childcare and economic engagement. Her PhD is a gendered political economy analysis of maternity benefit amendment act in India from a feminist political ethics of care lens. I think I'll stop there for the introductions. I think we're in very good hands on this topic of uh, care and I'd like to hand over for the presentation, please. Uh, hi, I think the audio will also come uh, accompany the recording. We're taking care of the issue here. Just one moment. Thank you for your patience. So as we work uh, towards getting the technical issue uh, taken care of here, um, we're going to move to the next speaker and that way we won't uh, lose too much time. Just one moment, please, as she sets up. Thank you for your patience.
Okay, we're, we're set up for moving on to our next speaker. And what we'll end up doing here is just change things around a little bit. We're going to move on to the fostering enabling environment for women entrepreneurs in Asia Pacific presentation. Then we'll move on to private sector engagement and then we'll come back to the care economy. And that should be a nice smooth transition, transition at any cent and give a, sufficient time to fix the, the technical issue. So I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Ms. Suda Guti, who is the program manager for Catalyzing Women's Entrepreneurship Program at UNSCAP. Prior to joining ESCAP, Ms. Guti has been working for the past 15 years with various UN agencies such as UNDP and IOM in different countries of Asia. Her areas of focus have been gender and governance, disaster risk reduction, and poverty reduction. ESCAP actively supports its member states in their efforts to enhance women's economic empowerment and entrepreneurship as a strategy for poverty reduction, social well-being, and sustainable economic growth. I'd like to hand over now to Ms. Suda Guti for her presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joni, and uh, good morning. And uh, good morning to all colleagues and good afternoon to all our colleagues on the Fiji there. So, um, it's been a fascinating morning of presentations where a number of issues have been covered in terms of uh, the barriers as well as the opportunities that women in our region are facing and what, is, what are some of the solutions that we can come up with, uh, especially in this unprecedented context. Uh, my presentation will focus more on the entrepreneurship uh, and look at uh, the overall situation of entrepreneurship, but also then move a little bit more into the COVID context. So I won't repeat many of the statistics that are coming in. Uh, we, we've also had an excellent presentation for, from our UN Women colleague uh, a, a few minutes back, but it's important to note that entrepreneurship as raised by several speakers is one of the main pathways of women's economic empowerment. And this does have a multiplier effect on family, on well-being, um, and overall sustainable growth. Uh, we also see that in our region, the micro, small and medium enterprises account for more than 96% of all enterprises, uh, providing employment for more than 62%. And out of this, we see that women own up to 50 to 59% uh, just in uh, Southeast Asia and Pacific as, as an example. This, this is very telling in terms of not only the significance of women entrepreneurs, but also the potential for growth when it comes to the whole entrepreneurship and women in the region. Uh, very quickly, I will move to um, what we're doing in terms of women entrepreneurship uh, on behalf of ESCAP. At ESCAP, one of the core areas of our work is on supporting our member states uh, to strengthen women's economic empowerment, and we consider entrepreneurship as a very important strategy for this. Um, this program is focusing on three different pillars, uh, looking at the policy and the enabling environment in which women entrepreneurs uh, function, we look at the various impact of policies and laws and regulations, sociocultural norms in which women entrepreneurs uh, function in a country and try to support a better enabling environment there. We also uh, work on addressing the credit gap that women entrepreneurs face through our innovative financing pillar, where we look at three different modalities of engaging in this, uh, looking at uh, a challenge fund where we promote more FinTech related uh, programs. We also work on um, a, a livelihood bond as well as an impact investment fund in partnership with various other agencies. And we also look at uh, strengthening the uh, information communication technology and business skills of women entrepreneurs, which, which especially now is a very important pillar of our work. Um, before I move into the COVID context, I just wanted to highlight some of the things that we're doing in this program and looking uh, more from the perspective of the role of the governance, we work with a number of partners and stakeholders at the country level, uh, but I just wanted to highlight some of the um, initiatives and the innovations that our country governments are leading uh, through this program. The policy pillar of the uh, uh, Catalyzing Women's Entrepreneurship Program looks at five different ways of engaging at the national level. We look at evidence, um, and generating evidence through in-depth research. 
Uh, for example, we have done a number of studies in Samoa. We will be doing a study in Fiji as well as in Bangladesh, looking at the uh, barriers that women entrepreneurs face in, in these countries, uh, not only on the overall enabling environment, but also looking at specific issues related to access and usage of finance, looking at access and usage of uh, ICT in these countries. Um, through the evidence generated, uh, we also provide a lot of technical assistance that helps us to work with the existing uh, laws, regulations that the women entrepreneurs work in these countries. For example, in, uh, in Vietnam, we are working on um, looking at the impact of the SME law in the country and how the women uh, led on, uh, enterprises uh, benefit or not from the SME law and what provisions need to be included in better implementation uh, of the SME law. Similarly, in Cambodia, and I know that some of our colleagues from Cambodia are also on the, on the meeting today, um, we, we worked on the national SME policy to include special provisions that benefit women entrepreneurs in Cambodia. We also look at capacity development as a very important pillar in this program. We work with a, a number of governments on looking at skill development of women entrepreneurs on ICT and other aspects, but also government is leading some of these initiatives. For example, again in Cambodia, uh, the Ministry of Women Affairs, we're working very closely on the design of an entrepreneurship development institute there which not only is looking at innovations from the region and beyond, but is also building on local innovations in Cambodia, such as the work that she investments and others are doing in there. We also believe that setting up multi-stakeholder mechanisms is an extremely important component of creating this ecosystem for women entrepreneurs to thrive. Um, we also, of course, like like the meeting today itself, we also bring this issue to the table at various regional and uh, global uh, platforms to look at exchange of innovative solutions when it comes to women entrepreneurs. I'll dive straight into the COVID context now, um, the focus really of our discussions uh, largely today. And uh, of course, we are seeing that COVID has impacted women entrepreneurs heavily. Um, we have seen the statistics already that our colleague Sarah has, has, has uh, explained very well. I won't repeat it, but we see that this has had a tremendous impact on the, entrepreneur, on the enterprises as well as the women employed in all of these uh, enterprises. It goes to say that men are also impacted, but it's the additional vulnerability that women are exposed to, which makes it uh, worse. At ESCAP, through the uh, Catalyzing Women's Entrepreneurship Program, we've done a few preliminary studies to dive deep into some of these issues and collectively come up with some solutions for our government partners. And I'll take a few minutes to focus on some of the studies. Um, those are the three countries that we've done studies and we're also doing it in a few others. Uh, but I'll dive into a couple of slides to give a flavor of some of the recommendations that are coming out of these specific studies. And uh, hopefully these will be useful even for countries beyond where we've done these studies. So a quick glimpse um, of the uh, Cambodia study that we did. The Cambodia uh, policy guideline was developed on a very quick assessment uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic on women entrepreneurs there. And uh, really there were no surprises in terms of how this has impacted, especially the informal sector, where uh, the access to financial services is very limited. Uh, there was already existing low levels of collateral and asset ownership of several women entrepreneurs and the COVID-19 only made it harder for them to access any kind of finance. There were significant socio-cultural barriers that further uh, added to women entrepreneurs access to services um, after COVID. Uh, internet, digital literacy uh, in rural areas further restricted women's ability uh, to conduct business online. Added to this was that electricity connection in, uh, was unreliable in rural areas, making, making e-commerce and other ICT-based solutions not viable. Um, and also, when we look at the informal and micro enterprises, they do not have uh, uh, normally large cash reserves to also cope with such um, uh, uh, pandemics. So uh, these were some of the recommendations we came up with. Um, 
And one of the things that I wanted to highlight in uh, Cambodia is, of course, data informed policy making. And we've also seen this from the experience of the Ebola pandemic, that the need to collect quality data uh, to understand and measure the extent of the effect is extremely important. And policymakers can use this significantly in designing uh, some of the mechanisms. I will not go into all of the recommendations, but we'll be happy to share the full paper uh, subsequently. But I just wanted to take less than a minute also to focus on some of the uh, recommendations coming out of Vietnam. Uh, there were, v Vietnam was a much more in-depth study we conducted of doing an online survey of 220 enterprises with more than 61% of it women led. And some of the findings um, were very interesting. Uh, notably, it was also showing that women led enterprises had a better resilience in coping with some of the um, uh, issues that came out. Uh, and uh, these are also highlighted in some of the slides which can be shared with all of you. In the interest of time, I'll just go straight into the recommendations. Um, one of the things that was very interesting, and uh, let me just highlight this slide for a moment, is we also did a little bit of an assessment of what enterprises perceived in terms of the support policies that were available by the government. And it showed that almost 63% of the enterprises were aware of the policies. But when it came to actual usage of the support that was available uh, and the information, it came down to about 2% in many of the regions. So this also shows that the issue is not only about provision of services for women entrepreneurs in general, but also how it becomes accessible, how the information is disseminated, which is extremely important. So here are some of the um, overall measures that we've uh, clustered. An important aspect that came out of the study is it's, it's, it's critical to not let the overall progress that women entrepreneurs have made uh, be derailed because of COVID-19. So while measures are being put in place in the short term, it's extremely important that the long-term um, uh, measures that were happening before COVID are not forgotten. And uh, those, those continue in parallel in terms of building a better ecosystem for women entrepreneurs. So I'll stop there and I'll be happy to answer any um, questions that there are. Uh, and leave this last slide on as silver linings also that have come out of COVID-19 um, and how some of the uh, enterprises have shown resilience uh, in the wake of this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Guti. A very interesting presentation with a lot of rich information and data, um, really highlighting the importance of women's entrepreneurship developments uh, and women's leadership in the private sector. Um, as we can see, there are multiple barriers, even in COVID times, um, which some of them reflect uh, women's barriers when we look at employment as well, uh, quality of jobs and opportunities that they can avail as women entrepreneurs. So SCAP is covering a lot of areas with a very strong focus on access to finance, but I really do appreciate the, the strong evidence-based policy making that you're pushing uh, uh, at at the national level. Often we get regional um, reports that don't go into such depth, and I think it shows that you're able to make strong linkages at the local level with various partners and um, stakeholders already involved in this area uh, and strengthening that ecosystem. So uh, thank you so much for that and we invite participants to have a look at all of the details that are found not only in the presentation but as well as I believe reports that are available. So that is uh, our presentation um, looking at enabling environment for women entrepreneurs in Asia Pacific and now we're going to move on uh, to the next speaker. Uh, working on holistic approaches to private sector engagement to boost women's economic empowerment. And we have uh, esteemed speaker uh, Katia Freewald, a regional program lead for We Empower Asia at UN Women's Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Ms. Friedwald 
Ms. Freewald leads UN Women's Commitment under Women's Economic Empowerment and Migration Focus in Asia and the Pacific. She oversees Women, uh, We Empower Asia at UN Women's Program, which is funded and in partnership with the European Union and is aiming to increase the number of women who lead and participate in business. The countries of focus are China, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. So quite a broad reach. And a key component of the program is to mobilize the private sector companies to become more gender responsive. Now we have another eight minutes for Katya. I hand over to you and uh, take the floor, please, Katya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joni, and um, I will try to be as efficient as possible to keep us on track in time. And you have set the scene uh, brilliantly and gave already a little bit of an introduction into the program. And I'm also going to keep it very much um, speaking about um, the program. Um, for the simple reason, I really want to kind of find a way to bridge the gap between talking and walking. And we empower Asia, as Joni laid out quite um, um, clearly, is a program which is aiming to promote women's economic empowerment and particularly really focusing on increasing women's economic participation um, in Asia and the specific and specifically the seven countries um, we have heard before. Um, as clearly stated also in the Asia Pacific um, Beijing Declaration, the role of the private sector is very important in achieving women's economic empowerment. And particularly, I think, in the current situation that we are in, where we are really focusing on a more gender equal and inclusive um, recovery from the pandemic. We have been speaking with quite a lot of private sector um, actors in the region and beyond. And while I have to say there's a lot of good practices to be shared and happy to do this um, in more detail, but there's a lot of work to be done as well. Also recognizing very strongly that um, the importance that um, our region has really signed and ratified a lot of um, international conventions um, or implemented guiding principles like the business and human rights principles to really um, engage private sector much more clearly um, in this agenda. Now, the way how at um, at We Empower Asia, we are trying to really create a more sort of blueprint of collaboration and um, really amplifying the role of the private sector is kind of focused on three pillars. So looking at um, the circle on the slide, the three pillars that we are looking at is first, obviously working with private sector companies, um, national companies, international com companies, and really driving more business inclusive cultures. The second pillar is all about gender inclusive entrepreneurship and Suda has shared a lot of that um, already but when we speak about gender inclusive entrepreneurship I really want to highlight that it's not only about supporting women entrepreneurs which is a very strong focus of this but really we've heard our ecosystem of entrepreneurs 96 percent in Asia Pacific are small medium enterprises. So we really want to work on bringing this ecosystem, a gender lens to this ecosystem. So not only working with women entrepreneurs, but with the real ecosystem around entrepreneurship. And last but not least, I think bringing both things together, um, and we're speaking about the enabling environment. These are really initiatives within our program where we look at policy context, but also bringing, for example, entrepreneurs and the private sector, bigger companies together, providing market access in a more general Gender, um, inclusive way. Now let me um, move on and just show this example or this framework which we kind of try to test in different um, areas and I know we're going to be hearing a little bit more about care and the care economy um, in a while but I just want to share the same framework of these three pillars. Um, we have started at UN Women to really kind of engage with our um, partners, um, CSOs, governments, and the private sector to really apply this framework to the care economy. So basically what you're looking at here is our attempt and our call for action to really create an action alliance for care work. And ladies and gentlemen, let me just say, if there is not a better moment 
than now to really address this. I don't know when there will be a better moment. I think I'm not repeating all the evidences. We have heard enough statistics today, not only about the issue and um, unpaid care work as an issue to hold women back to participate in the economy, but let me emphasize on the opportunity of um, the care economy that really has the opportunity to provide way more jobs in our region. And ILO has done a lot of studies around that and we will be um, seeing also that um, our region will need more care professions with a very um, a trend el of elderly population. But the way how to really address this needs to be collaborative in an inclusive way. So really looking at government actions like care financing, like providing infrastructure. That, but then I'm also pleased we're gonna be hearing out from an entrepreneur that we have been working very strongly with in Malaysia to provide really opportunities in the care economy, which is about turning the, the women's entrepreneurship um, opportunity into the care economy. So we will be seeing models on how women entrepreneurs can really thrive or solve the care challenge, but also looking care as a uh, provision for more jobs in our regions. And as Tony said in the beginning, I'm looking also at our migration work. And obviously there's a lot of migrants in our regions that are employed in the domestic um, sector, most of the time in a very informal way. So there's a big opportunity to also use um, that economy for the benefits of um, our um, Asian Pacific economy. And last but not least, the role of private sector that um, we are emphasizing on is really strong in, um, in, in, in the care economy as well. And just kind of one of the, the examples I want to share, we are working in Vietnam, obviously, very um, strongly in our program. There's a lot of evidence now coming out, some of the private sectors investing in care facilities, for example, increasing their um, or efficiency by 20% by reducing absenteeism. So there's a big, big business case for the care economy, which needs to be um, really an inclusive um, approach that we are seeking for. Now, speaking about the private sector, um, I just want to highlight, obviously, unpaid care work is one um, area, but we have heard about a lot of other areas today as well. And it's not only the year of the 25th anniversary, anniversary of the Beijing Declaration, but at UN Women and with our partners, we are also celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Women's Empowerment Principles, which is an initiative between Global Compact and UN Women to really help to drive more private sector action, to really build more gender inclusive businesses. And as you can see here, and I'm not going in all detail, but it's really a blueprint on different actions, looking at corporate leadership, looking at gender equality in the workplace, including addressing things like sexual harassment, is looking about upskilling for women um, in uh, companies, really addressing things like the digital gap, for example, but also looking into things like how to procuring much more from women-owned enterprises. So um, gender responsive procurement is a big area within this. So while this is for the moment a volunteer framework in, um, at a global level, we in Asia Pacific really want to kind of drive this much more forward as something which companies can be held um, accountable for. So moving on to the next slide, I just want to say um, and leave you probably with this thought that um, we have a, a call for action for companies to share best practices. And we have seen a lot of this. And I think this is one way to stimulate more action, but I don't think that's the only way. And it's the, the way that will systemically change um, the way how private sector incorporates um, a gender lens in their operations. So what we are calling for is really formalizing much more um, reporting, transparency on how private sector is embracing gender equality in their operations. So you will be seeing more, and we've been working with our colleagues from ASEAN on some more um, study and research around gender reporting of the private sector in our regions. And let me close this by this. I think we need to create this transparency now much more than ever, because through this transparency, we are only gonna create transformation that is really needed to not reverse the strikes that we have made on women's economic empowerment in our region. With this, thank you very much. Um, and I'll hand it over to Tony and hope you kept us in time. Right on time. Thank you very much, Katya.
um, a very interesting, exciting program looking at both sides of what seems to be the same coin of women-led enterprises, uh, improving their opportunities, but at the same time looking at enterprises themselves and creating more gender responsive workplaces. Um, I like that you've uh, talked a lot about the opportunity uh, to grow uh, accessible, affordable, professional care services, looking at the care, care economy um, solutions that um, are emerging and need those critical investments from government, but also other stakeholders. and taking into account the undervaluing of both paid and unpaid care. And we see um, through your uh, rich examples of uh, showcasing the opportunities related to the WEPS framework to further enhance private sector's um, involvement in making uh, workplaces more gender responsive. But I like that you ended off with accountability and transparency, which seems to be critical these days, uh, especially in COVID-19 and the, as we heard in the beginning, um, we're seeing uh, regression in some areas. Uh, so this will be very important to keep pushing on upholding the already agreed commitments. Thank you so much for this uh, presentation. And uh, now we will have our final presentation, which is on the CARE economy and we've had our um, technicians come to set it up. I had already introduced Ms. Deepta Chopra and Ms. Minakashi Krishnan. So I think we can uh, move on to this presentation, Care Economy and Women's Economic Participation. Are we ready? And I'm going to Thank give you. you a little brief background of um, the care economy and uh, women's economic participation, specifically focusing on the challenges and opportunities that COVID has given us. Um, so as we know that care is not just direct care as in care of people, but it's also indirect care, which is like looking after the household, cooking, cleaning, and uh, also um, collecting firewood and water, which forms a big part of women's lives. Um, we do uh, know that um, that care is necessary for the social reproduction and sustenance of life and human beings and this is not uh, an audience that i would um, you know want to um, go into much more detail because you guys already know this that uh, but what is really important to understand and to keep in mind while we go through through thinking about care is that care has a widespread long-term and positive impact on well-being and development and it is critical to address inequality and vulnerability. Um, now there are bi-directional loops between care economy and the paid, paid economy and by, by bi-directional I mean that and in as much as care affects uh, women's paid work, uh, women's paid work also affects uh, the quality and quantity of care that they do. Um, so, uh, but you know, when we think about unpaid care work, we also think that women, uh, that it does occupy, literature tells us that it occupies large amounts of women and girls' time, which then in turn restricts their participation in civil, economic and social spheres. Um, unpaid care work interacts with paid work in many ways. Um, uh, because of unpaid care work, women are um, choose, and I put that in inverted commas, to take informal sector jobs because these choices are not necessarily um, uh, choices that they would make, uh, uh, you know, without without the constraints that care puts on them. Um, but also then the drudgery um, that, that is involved in taking uh, care of people or cooking or cleaning, or especially collecting firewood and water, really affects women's health and productivity. On the other hand, that, that you know these informal sector jobs that women do, they're also very drudgerous, and this then affects, as I said, the quantity and quality of care, and the women's health and productivity in care in the care economy as well. Um, it leads to lower bargaining power, and uh, the most significant effects that we've seen in our research is about time poverty, tiredness, and depletion due to multitasking and interrupted sleep. Um, um, we've also seen that um, because of uh, when, when women go out to do paid work, there is an increase in care responsibilities for young girls and older women. 
Um, so um, really the premise, the basic premise of, of this um, talk is to, 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 to say that when we talk about women's empowerment, it really requires a balance between paid work and unpaid care work to avoid depletion. And that when we talk about economic empowerment, we really cannot just talk about labor force participation, but we also need to take into account the care work that women and girls do. Um, just some figures here, um, time spent daily in unpaid care work, paid work and total work by sex, by region and by income group. And you will see that in every single region of the world, uh, women do more unpaid care work than men, less paid work than women. Now, what is stark about the Asia and Pacific region is that um, cumulatively, uh, women are doing um, the largest amount of care and paid work and total work in the whole of the world um and that is um that is that that gives us needs to give us um pause for thought um now this is another graph uh, again from the same ilo uh, report which talks about how uh you know what what stops women from engaging in paid work and again the work family balance as well as affordable care is uh, is uh, you know are one of some of the highest um, categories of how women perceive uh, themselves as being challenged in order to take on paid jobs. Um, now, COVID nineteen has uh, exacerbated these inequalities and increased the precarity of these vulnerable populations, especially women, um, in three ways. Um, they've reduced women's economic participation because, women, as with everybody, uh, economic uh, sphere has really declined. Uh, but the most significant effect, obviously, has been to women's, um, uh, women's work, in, especially in the informal economy. Um, it has increased uh, women's care workload um, and this is it has also created new challenges uh, for responsibilities such as food provision uh, and water provision and you know how do you how do you go and collect water uh, in, 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 in situations of lockdown or buy food uh, and women have had to uh, spend large amounts of time queuing for um, for food um, and the third of course uh, um, uh, thing that kill COVID has done is reduction of state provision of public services uh, um, because of the pressure on um, resources. Um, the Beijing Plus 25 agenda, the, 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 the 2030 agenda, really requires a focus on tackling high rates of women's informal work, provision of social protection, as well as incentives for them to remain in the workforce. So when we talk about COVID and an effective recovery plan, it really needs to be differentiated to account for the different needs and responsibilities that women have um, as compared to when men have, but also uh, thinking about specific vulnerable groups like women in the informal sector, um, like the Beijing 25 Agenda has focused our attention on. Um, now, our research is really thinking about uh, what are the care differentiated policies that have been initiated in the Asia Pacific region as a response to COVID-19 and to provide policy recommendations and guidelines on these specific policy initiatives that can be taken. Um, but we are also really wanting to dig deep into two separate in-depth case studies um, in two countries of the Asia Pacific region with providing specific country specific representation uh, recommendations sorry um, keeping in mind of course women's differential and specific needs in these two, two countries due to their unpaid care work um, our conceptual framework then uh, thinks about the fact of uh, what I've said, which is that recognition of care is foundational. But when we talk about the care economy and unpaid care work, uh, we know already that individual and household characteristics, country specific context, as well as emerging socioeconomic trends in the region or in that country are going to affect how the care economy works. Uh, but um, with COVID, we need to now think about differentiated policy responses um, and uh, we've classified them into four types. One is care infrastructure, the second is care related social protection transfers, the third is care services and the fourth is employment related policies. Um, so I conclude really my presentation with some of the priority issues that we think we need to address in the Asia Pacific region and uh, after this I will open the floor to question and answers which my colleague Meenakshi uh, will um, uh, will uh, uh, answer 
And um, so these priority issues really are fourfold. One is obviously to move from uh, what we call a double burden of women in terms of looking at both paid work as well as their unpaid care work to a double boon situation, which in which um, incorporates provision of decent paid work. Um, that empowers women and provides support for their unpaid care work. And this really includes provisional social protection initiatives. When we talk about decent work, uh, we talk about, um, we need to talk about not only flexible working times, but also safe and affordable transportation that gets women to and from uh, their paid work with minimum time, energy and resources. Um, reduction of the drudgery of paid work through technological innovations and adequate remuneration, specifically gender equal pay. Um, and we can uh, we can think of policies that provide support for unpaid care work, and this can be through recognition of care work through collection of sex disaggregated data. Uh, time use surveys are very important in this. Uh, provision of childcare services, but also maternity protection services. Provision of healthcare and education so that women are able to um, take care of their children and their families in a in a um, in a more sustainable way. Um, again, reduction of drudgery of care work through technological innovations, um, cooking stoves, um, but also uh, piped water um, are important. Uh, gas uh, provision of uh, gas is, is really important. Um, and redistribution of care work to the state, provision of public services, um, as well as change in social norms so that men can take on care work responsibilities as and when possible. And finally, representation of carers in decision making where, you know, we, we, we we're going to talk about um, policies that really um, include women in their um, uh, in, 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 in decision making processes. So with that, I leave you. Thank you so much for your attention uh, today. And uh, I look forward to your feedback. Uh, thanks very much. So we thank the speaker for their very comprehensive uh, presentation on uh, care. Um, looking to see the uh, role of each uh, player in um, upholding that service as a public good as well. And I'd like to mention um, from the ILO side, of course, we're always pushing to say that the government has a very strong role to play in terms of public care services, uh, but also acknowledging, as you've well put, the country specific context uh, will play out uh, in how care infrastructures work. Um, you mentioned integrated approaches towards addressing paid and unpaid care. And I was very happy to hear you mention um, equal pay for work of equal value. And uh, just mentioning that September 18th is International Equal Pay Day. Um, if you didn't know, there's, there'll be a celebration for the first time on this, uh, but significant um, gender pay gap, and in particular, in terms of undervaluing of the care economy. Um, I also wanted to um, thank you for bringing up the issue of uh, violence and uh, harassment as well. As you've mentioned, care sector has a large proportion, of course, majority women, but also a large proportion of domestic workers and um, is, is providing opportunities to address this very uh, important and critical um, service that uh, will enable more women to participate act actively in the economy, but at the same time, uh, a sector fraught with challenges. So there's a lot to be done um, to address this, but many opportunities laid out in the recommendations. And I thank you very much for that. All right, we've been through four presentations and um, now is the time to reach over to our discussants who are two and um, both have very important perspectives to share with us on the various topics that we've addressed during the session so far. Um, I will start with Ms. Nadira Maud Yusuf, who is the founder and CEO of KidoCare. And she is also part of the ASEAN Women Entrepreneurs Network, the head in Malaysia. Ms. Yusuf is the founder of KidoCare, which is the first of its kind in Malaysia, a mobile platform that connects parents with trained, reliable babysitters and childminders. 
inspired by ride hailing service like Grab, Kiddo Care enables women to grab a babysitter from the comforts of their home. Kiddo Care also provides a platform for women to pursue their career in childcare or children's education, economically empowering them with more flexible employment arrangements and growth opportunities. I'll hand over to Ms. Yusuf, and uh, the floor is yours for five minutes of um, discussant comments. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, very happy to be here together with everyone uh, in, the, in the expert group meeting. Um, so um, I guess uh, uh, listening to all the presenters, uh, the issues uh, of how COVID actually affects us is very real. Um, and in Malaysia, I think um, we're quite blessed uh, that uh, the government has been putting uh, a lot of incentives uh, to help uh, entrepreneurs as well as women uh, to you know, rise through this, this economic uh, recovery period. And uh, I'd like to also, you know, very happy to share with everyone that Kido Care is currently also one of the vehicles that has been recognized as an economic uh, recovery vehicle for women economy empowerment. Um, okay. So how we're dealing with things here, just like uh, you know the the, the uh, everything that has been shared, uh, we are trying to promote a lot more women going into entrepreneurship. And I guess in Malaysia, uh, we can clearly see that uh, our women uh, tend to thrive uh, better uh, than our male counterpart. I suppose because of the. Uh, nature of business itself. So many women are in the production of food businesses and services um, that are needed uh, for, for during the COVID period. So many women actually um, uh, do a lot better uh, in terms of their business. But this depends on uh, you know, the ability of getting access to technology, the ability of having uh, you know, good supply chain uh, uh, access that can, you know, import, uh, so rather transport their products and, and things like that. And because women's businesses tend to be very, uh, a lot smaller than men's businesses uh, in micro and, and uh, smaller businesses, uh, they could uh, sustain themselves better unless, of course, they are very uh, limited to that locality and then they will have to find is the, the difficulty. I guess the pie has always been small for women entrepreneurs in general, but the COVID has further shrunk that pie. And what we have to do is to increase that pie uh, for women if we want um, them to be better empowered. So in terms of what Kido Care is doing, uh, we are providing vehicle for women who has been displaced of their jobs, especially those in the service sectors um, that has been uh, much affected. Um, aviation industry, hotel industry, although it's picking up pretty well in Malaysia, but aviation has been seriously affected uh, to repurpose their skills and come in to, to uh, see how they could participate in care work. And that has been uh, pretty successful. Um, our types of service that allows personal care at home uh, also addresses uh, real uh, need for care services, especially by the frontliners during the, the lockdown. Um, and now we're looking at making uh, personalized childcare even more affordable uh, by establishing a social enterprise transit centers, uh, partnering with uh, corporate organizations and government, looking into unused uh, facilities, government facilities, um, mosques and, and things like that, converting them to become uh, transit centers that also provides uh, enhancement or rather enrichment activities for the children. Uh, we also provide a career development uh, program for our carers uh, who you know, can come in as a babysitter, uh, flexible, but of course we put them through our onboarding program which includes training, certification, background check and things, things like that. But they could grow within the program in which we have implemented our Kido Care Academy, uh, allowing them to work gain experience, gain pay, at the same time learn and move along to become nannies, personal nannies, uh, 
nannies for children with uh, learning disabilities, um, educators, entrepreneurs, and, and things like that. So there are a lot more uh, growth in that area, opportunities as well. But what's uh, also um, a challenge for us is uh, the regulation uh, that may not support our new type of uh, business and services. Uh, we're very lucky, uh, Kido Care, um, in terms of uh, you know highlighting the kind of need for new services and new business models, innovation led, uh, because we're working a lot with uh, UN Women and under the Women uh, Economic Principles, we're uh, uh, going around and getting companies to also recognize the need to support employers, uh, sorry, employees. Uh, with this type of services, allowing them to uh, benefit from flexible working, allowing them to focus on work while we have the carers uh, taking care of the children at home. So they may not need uh, full-time um, maids or, or nannies, but they will need some kind of an effective time at work. Uh, the collaboration that we have with you and women also through AWEN has also allowed our women entrepreneurs to embrace a lot more technology in their businesses. Uh, by doing that, allowing them to have flexible working arrangements and uh, giving uh, a win-win situation in which they thrive better in their businesses, but also allows other women to come in and take care of their families. Um, so yeah, those are you know sharing a little bit of what we're doing and how the situation is in Malaysia and how we're working, uh, public sector and together with uh, our funding partners, uh, NGOs and CSOs, trying to raise funds for um, you know, other women with uh, uh, more vulnerable situations. So we're also looking into um, uh, parents who are you know, striving or, or living with uh, uh, cancer and other types of illnesses and could not go out for work. Um, and I think it's really, really crucial for us to bring in more impact investors at the moment and supporting social enterprises, cooperatives, because it's now, this is the time for us to build communities uh, rather than individuals. So that's what I can say at the moment. Uh, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to address them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yusuf. A very exciting social enterprise model over in Malaysia. And, um, it's interesting to hear that uh, women-led enterprises are faring better, uh, possibly, as you say, because they are micro and small, they are more flexible to respond, uh, but hopefully as well, they are having um, uh, opportunities uh, to respond to the needs. And Malaysia has brought forward some very progressive uh, women-led business programs. I like that you have um, been promoting personalized uh, and affordable childcare solutions. You seem to have been um, shaping the standards as well for the childcare sector in Malaysia. Um, and uh, this is a very uh, exciting initiative. Uh, I like that you ended off as well with the need for um, collective uh, effort and the collaborations that you already have internationally with organizations such as UN Women, but also your ASEAN network uh, linkages. Um, this is a very important area and uh, thank you very much for those comments. Now we have our final discussant and last but certainly not least by any means, Ms. Kai Yiping. She is a Chinese feminist researcher and activist. She co-leads Dawn's sexual and re reproductive health and rights activities. She participated in creating several vibrant women's NGOs in China after the Fourth World Conference on Women held in Beijing. These included the Media Monitoring uh, Network for Women and uh, Network Research Center for Combating Domestic Violence. I'd like to hand over to Ms. Kai Yiping. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's my great honor to have this opportunity to speak in, as the last speaker of this morning session. Um, I, when I listened to the presentation, um, I also monitoring the text message in the chat box. So I'm multitasking, uh, I think, like every woman that's during the COVID have to dealing with. 
um, situation. So um, just response to the, um, the both the chat box and the presentation as well as the guiding question provided to us. So the crisis we had experienced, we experienced now is, you know, we had never had this experience before. It not began with the financial sectors, not the economic, you know, crisis. It's not even the political tension or catastrophe. It start with health sector, and soon both the government take measure to contain the, um, the spread of virus to put the whole economic in hunt, which we had never seen in human history. So when we review the section F, women and economy in the Beijing plan for action in the context of COVID-19, there is a need, urgent need to reflect how the society has organized to operate and regulate the economic activities, which largely has based on the extractivism and expo exploitation of nature of women, of workers. And this is a de development model that leads to the glaring inequality and unsustainability. So this is the time to rethink how to distribute and redistribute the wealth, the work, especially the care work, as many speakers have mentioned, and the way to organize the production, the reproduction, including the biological reproduction and the social reproduction. So here is my reflection. The three, I have a three reflection to share with you. First, about care work and essential work. Those terms has become a buzzword in the past few months. Ironically, this also the work that is crucial for survival and well-being of human society during the COVID, but it's also the work that has been long devalued. Um, the data collected by LO and other agencies and the research that has been done by the previous speakers has suggested that the women are concentrating in the sectors that are most affected by the COVID-19 or the most risky one that's exposed to the infection, such as health sectors, social service sectors, food production and processing industries, domestic workers, etc. Women are also comprise the majority of the informal sectors, which are not entitled to the benefit of compensation, paid leaves, or government support plan. How do the policies reflect this reality in order to not only build back better, but build forward towards equality, uh, towards the justice? How to de demo uh, democratize decision-making to ensure the voice and, and experience of women and all the marginalized groups are considered and integrated into this process? So this is the one, um, I don't have answer, I have only the question, sorry. The second one is um, how we can monitoring and evaluate um, the, the measures that have been taken by many governments to, as a response to the pandemic, including investment to build more robust, robust the public health system, subsidize the social services, extend the social protection and security to the workers that previously excluded. Some of these measures are considered quite radical which may not be the option, policy options, if there were no, you know, incidents of the pandemic. For example, you know, that's kind of universal basic income plan of some sort, economic uh, support plans, uh, economic stimulate plans, et cetera, et cetera. However, most of these measures are short term and ad hoc as emergency response and support. As we know, the pandemic will not go away in the very near future in a couple of months, Therefore, the long-term and more comprehensive, systematic, coherent policies are definitely needed. So policy do not have to bounce back and forth between lockdown and reopening the economy, between dilemma of safe lives or safe jobs. Agencies, government, and civil societies are monitoring those economic measures, policies for their effect. Those policies are monitoring is uh, for the purpose of the you know, see whether it's effective, uh, whether it's, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, work. But I think it should be definitely monitored from the gender perspective, from the perspective of human rights and justice, equality and non-discrimination. As the previous speaker already mentioned, even there is, uh, uh, you know, the um, financial support, there's a, a government plan, the incentive plan when women entrepreneurs do not have access to them and didn't get benefit from them. 
The last one, uh, but not the least, the in response to the guiding questions on what government can do to support women's economic empowerment. In addition to what the previous speaker have already mentioned, I would also like to uh, invite us to revisit Beijing Plan for Action in the context of COVID-19, the strategic objectives outlined in the section F, which still have a long way to go to achieve and now uh, obstructed by the serious crisis, including this one. This, uh, if we want to reach those uh, ob objective, um, strategic objectives, it will require the adequate on the long withstanding investment and financial resources to, re to strengthen the public sectors like a house, education, sanitation, infrastructure, and improve the social production. Um, they are often framed, those um, you know, financial resources, when talking about this, you know, public funding, they always frame as the expenses rather than the investment to increase the social capital. As we see in this pandemic, the societies that has already built a strong public sectors respond better and recover faster. It is time to revamp the economic, fiscal, and the financial policies, tax policies, to address inequality between countries. Because as we see this developing uh, countries as uh, much more vulnerable and uh, has mobilized uh, very, not even able to, you know, mobilize the, uh, the needed sources to cope with the, the crisis uh, compared to the developed uh, economies. So also, you know, uh, between the countries and also among different groups in the country, with still um, in inequality is on rising, unfortunately, as we need to uh, resilient to the new challenges escalated by the COVID-19, for example, emerging trends of that formation of economy, role of the gigantic, uh, gigantic um, fintech companies, the sectors that make amount of wealth and profit during the COVID-19. Based on the news, uh, what I heard is that the richest person in the world, actually their wealth is increased dramatically. So the new form of the financialization of development, those are the, you know, the, 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 the phenomenon that we also need to look closely. Um, too much front to cover here uh, in within the three minutes, I can't cover all of them, but I want um, uh, maybe post these questions, uh, maybe as a starting point. So when we are trying to interrogate those questions, uh, we can ask who are taking the risks and who are making the profits? Where are the women? And where are those marginalized and deprived groups? I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Yiping. Uh, very uh, thought-provoking end off on, from the discussant, uh, taking us back to the Beijing plan for action. Uh, uh, I like that you have mentioned uh, the investments and, and not an expense when we look at these very important infrastructures that have seen through uh, some of the countries that have had better um, responses to the COVID crisis by having those uh, public uh, infrastructures in place. Um, but you rightly point out that we are seeing more inequalities between the very rich and uh, those who are becoming poorer. Uh, I'd like to end off quite quickly here because I understand we are running out of time and we want to get on to the next part of the session. Thanking very much our two discussants. We've heard now from our four panelists and uh, our two discussants and we'd like to move on to Q&A to get uh, your comments and suggestions from the chat box. I hand over now to Shannon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yoni, and thank you to everyone who has been so actively participating in a very live box chat, uh, taking place behind the scenes while the presentations were going on. Uh, we have a number of commentaries and questions. And so firstly on the commentaries, what we can say is that we will definitely uh, take into consideration all of your views and comments and seek to include them to the greatest extent possible in the meeting report that will be coming out uh, after this meeting. We had uh, commentaries uh, around the social protection mechanisms and how to extend it to 
healthcare workers and other workers in the informal economy who have been excluded to date, uh, how to build awareness uh, for women uh, around gender responsive initiatives. And there was also a particular good conversation about the digital divide and sharing of um, information in this regard. So please do continue these conversations in the chat box. Uh, it is a nice new way for us to be conducting these meetings. Now, um, in addition, there was also a number of uh, commentaries uh, raised around the inclusion of vulnerable groups, um, women with disabilities, migrant workers, uh, women migrant workers, and women uh, farmers as well. And then there was a sharing of good practice. We heard from uh, Jane Sloan on uh, the Gender Voice Lab. I think information has been shared around that already to prevent gender-based violence and also some uh, possible propositions on how good practice around pro-Indigenous procurement policies might also be appropriated for pro-women procurement policies. And uh, we had um, a commentary from the Cabinet Office of um, Japan on the ways in which they are integrating women's economic empowerment in their COVID-19 uh, response. And so we thank you for all these uh, commentaries. Now, with respect to the questions, there were a number of general ones and some uh, to particular speakers. Uh, I will start with the ones for the particular speakers. Um, Secretary Kativata uh, from Nepal has uh, three uh, questions um, to answer from the floor. The first one is with respect to the 10 bill fund, uh, whether any of these are earmarked for women and what the criteria are, uh, what the eligibility criteria are. And we had also another um, question for Secretary Kativada on the Nepal Child Grant Benefit Support and uh, asking how other, how social protection measures are being considered now in the context of COVID-19. And whether, the last question, there are any government plans for promoting the livelihood of women with disabilities. Uh, we also had a question from the floor uh, from a participant in Kyrgyzstan who's asking uh, Ms. Ms. Freiwald from UN Women uh, leading on the We Empower program on whether there is any possibility to include other countries in Asian Pacific or to learn the model of the program that was presented. So these were the specific questions uh, to speakers uh, that we could summarize so far and uh, a number of general ones as well. Uh, overarchingly, the question was asked how and what should be the next steps to achieve the SDG 5 on gender equality in the Asia Pacific region. So this is a, an, a generalized um, question to all of the speakers, but also some very specific ones, such as whether you can comment on what can be done about the fact that governments are increasingly downgrading public sector employees so that they are not recognized as formal employees. And a, an example here was given uh, of the accredited social health activists in, in India. Uh, we also had other questions around how you propose to ensure that all workers are recognized regardless of the sectors that they work in. Uh, and there are some good examples in this regard, as had been shared by Ms. Farida uh, from Shir Gah in Pakistan. And again, the, her second question relates to the social security scheme, how to make it increasingly robust if currently uh, un, unregulated. And I think the last general question to uh, speakers that I would mention here is on farmers, uh, how can we imply uh, apply the women economic framework to women farmers. Uh, and here some facts were mentioned that in many developing countries in Asia, uh, women are more than constitute half of the farming, farming population. Uh, but I think it's also worth reflecting on the questions that was raised by our discussions. And in particular, I wanted to just um, raise one by Ms. Chai Yiping on the monitoring efforts, how to uh, make that increasingly systematic. And so over to you, Joni, live from the chat box. Uh, 
So now I'd like to invite uh, the esteemed Secretary, uh, Government of Nepal, to respond. If you'd like to take the floor. Maybe you are muted. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your uh, questions. Uh, especially, I have a uh, got uh, one question regarding this fund mm -hmm. as we have uh, different types of fund uh, especially focusing for the covid impact to activate uh, the economic activities and for the new new entrepreneurs who uh, really want to establish their new business so we have one fund uh, 15 billion that i got the uh, uh, questions so whether it is for women or not it, yes it is also for women too but it's not only for women and this is a 15 billion not 10 uh, 50 billion funds uh, this is for the revival of their business who uh, are already established but they they are suffering from covid uh, so this is especially for uh, the working capital and paying for their staff. So uh, we have another fund. This this 50 billion fund is uh, just for established business uh, so who are suffering from COVID. And let me go to the another fund. We have another challenge fund. Uh, this is uh, 500 million um, Nepali rupees. Uh, this is for everyone. That means uh, the the new enterprises, entrepreneurs who wants to start their business with new ideas in, and innovation, uh, they will get uh, um, uh, um, a loan uh, with a concessional loan. It's a only 2% uh, interest rate. Uh, and for this, uh, eligibility is just the project proposal. They don't have to um, uh, need uh, like a collateral or, or everything, just they have a good project uh, and uh, innovative project, uh, they can um, receive this loan. And uh, third is the concessional loan, loan fund. Again, we have uh, uh, this type of loan with 5% um, interest rate. Uh, this is also based on the project. And um, this is for new, uh, entrepreneurs and also the established uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, this will be a bankable project. And if your project is uh, convincing, you will get uh, the loan uh, with 5% of um, interest rate. And we have a separate fund only for women. Uh, that is uh, especially for micro and small industries, micro, micro cottage and small industries. Uh, this is, they will get 1.5 million um, rupees. Uh, it is with 6% of interest rate and 1% will be rebate if uh, they pay back it on time. And for this, they don't have um, to keep any collateral, uh, just uh, they have to be recommended uh, from some, you know, the umbrella organization of some uh, enterprises like um, uh, Federation of um, uh, industry and commerce or micro industry associations um, of the local level or the district level. So it, it also um, is very easy uh, to get, but uh, so, so one recommendation uh, should be there. And other is the refinancing. This refinancing is a really good um, package. Uh, that is uh, almost 200 billion of fund, um, but it is based on uh, hard heated, middle, mid heated, and uh, low heated um, by the COVID. Uh, so there is no threshold for um, the uh, you know the amount of uh, the package, but it depends on your project and how much uh, it has been affected. It depends. Uh, so I think um, uh, uh, I address this first question uh, that is uh, regarding the fund. So we have uh, uh, five types of fund. Uh, it is for new uh, entrepreneurs and also for the established uh, entrepreneurs. Thank you. So uh, may I go to the second question? 
Yes, please, uh, quickly though, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it was uh, so related to, so I, I received one question from Lakshmi Nepal. Uh, thank you for your um, questions, Lakshmi ji. Uh, as you know, we have a uh, four category for the disabilities uh, and A and B, you know, they are getting uh, social securities um, allowances monthly. Uh, but uh, as you say, we don't have um, any particular, you know, the program for C and D categories. Uh, but uh, you, uh, you uh, uh, were concerned about the livelihood program. Yes, we have some livelihood program, uh, but we will carry on this type of program with um, cooperation, coordination with uh, other ministry and the local level. But if you um, come to us, of, or if you um, you know make a call in my ministry, or if you um, come to and see our focal person, because we have a dedicated focal person for um, to deal with these disabilities, and we can facilitate for their uh, livelihood program because uh, we have also allocated some you know the budget uh, for. Uh, um, livelihood program so uh, with other ministries and uh, so basically with uh, local level we can facilitate so uh, please um, i'd like to request you um, if you if you stay in carfondro or uh, where i don't know i think uh, um, or you can uh, connect us uh, in any way or you can just email me or you can just call to the secretary's office uh, so we will discuss in the ministry and how can we facilitate you yes, with other ministry and the local level with our, I know, the dedicated uh, budget. And regarding other um, social security uh, program, yes, this, uh, this, is, uh, this ministry is really dealing with the um, safety net uh, group, women, children. Um, and it's just uh, yesterday we, we marked the in, in national Children's Day in Nepal, uh, and uh, so, um, we have, uh, you know, dedicated the fund. We have uh, allocated the fund, but uh, so, uh, local government um, is uh, carry on as every uh, everything regarding the social securities, uh, but. Uh, uh, for children, our first uh, first priority, uh, not only for children, the um, people within the safety net, uh, our first priority is um, the protection, uh, protection approach. That means we uh, rescue, relief, and rehabilitate them. And we are working with closely uh, with the different national and international non-governmental organization and uh, other um, uh, stakeholders within the ministries because uh, even within the governmental organization because it's very much cross cutting so, uh, so the social security things uh, in in our in Nepal is dealing with the uh, Ministry of Home Affairs and uh, this is uh, distributed um, uh, by the local government that means is uh, related to federal um, ministry federal um, uh, affairs ministry. So we are coordinating and facilitating uh, for this all uh, social security things uh, with other ministry. And uh, anyway, we are leading and we will, we are welcome to receive this, um, you know, the complaint and um, uh, uh, complaint and issues uh, and we will facilitate. So uh, I would like to request Lakshmiji once again, uh, please, uh, the contact to the ministry. So there's a, a wonderful uh, moment for me to step in and say it seems there's a lot of interest there and uh, we encourage you to reach out to Ms. Katiwada to uh, get more information. We don't have a lot of time to uh, cover our last questions. Thank you so much. Very, very, very much information to share. Um, there are two more questions to address. The first one is to Katya Freewold from UN Women on the extension of We Empower Asia to new countries. And then there's a, a question for Ms. Guti Sudha on monitoring. So I, I'll hand over to both of them consecutively so we can be faster. Uh, over to you, Katya, and then over to Sudha. Thank you. 
Okay, quick and sharp. Um, unfortunately, uh, we empower Asia is for the time being limited to the countries I've mentioned. However, we are very much willing to share um, the principles and the, the learnings out, out of this in a wider sense. But I think uh, another initiative on how to engage uh, quickly and right now are the women's empowerment principles, where UN Women is working um, across the region. So I've shared in the chat already some resources and please um, reach out. This is something where we would love to work with any country in the region uh, more closely together. Over to you, Suda. Uh, thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, okay. So uh, I'm not really answering this question, but there were these very important issues raised by Ms. Chai Yiping and uh, reflecting on some ideas uh, really for discussion maybe over the course of tomorrow. Um, there are several uh, ways in which I think we can also enhance the transparency and hold governments accountable. Uh, and governments are taking the initiative to do so. For example, in, in Vietnam, uh, the reason we are embarking on this impact of SME law in the country is precisely to look at, there have been several iterations and revisions of the SME law, and how does it really impact women entrepreneurs in different parts of Vietnam, North, Central, South, and uh, what measures need to be taken for effective implementation. So uh, through that example, what I'm trying to say is that it's not only important to include measures and policies and laws, but also look at how they're actually impacting women entrepreneurs across or women. Uh, and it's, 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 it's an important angle to look at. In the context of COVID, one of the important aspects that, ha that has come up is governments are making tremendous efforts to provide support. But how uh, accessible uh, and easy is it for women to, to be able to um, uh, have access to these services and also use them is, is another issue. So are there ways in which we can hold governments accountable in disseminating this information? Uh, for example, we're working with one of the governments in setting up a special portal with uh, information related to COVID-related measures for women entrepreneurs. So are there more such initiatives in the region that can be shared and scaled up when it comes to increasing the transparency of how uh, these measures are helpful? Just a few ideas in, uh, given the uh, challenge of time right now, but we'll be happy to discuss more um, tomorrow uh, as we progress with the meeting. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone. And thank you so much to our presenters and discussants. I would offer them a round of applause or virtual or <laughs> uh, thanks to everyone for this rich conversation. Uh, thank you for being patient as well to extend a few minutes over. And uh, with that, I will hand back to Shani to take us to the next step. Thanks. Thank you very much, Yoni, and thank you to all participants for attending this um, session on our virtual expert group meeting on implementing the Asia-Pacific Declaration in the COVID-19 context. Now, this uh, concludes session two of the meeting and also the meeting for today. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. The meeting, uh, as mentioned earlier, will begin one uh, half an hour before uh, our meeting today at nine o'clock Thailand Standard Time. Uh, please do log in uh, a bit in advance so that we can uh, set up the technical tests once again. And we wish you a good afternoon, morning or evening, wherever you may be, and look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs>